Hi everyone, welcome to today's virtual event, What's Your 2020 Vision for 2020? I'm Teresa Resick, Director of Content Programs at AIM, and we're joined by our host and MC, Kevin Crane. And here at AIM, we believe that information is your most important asset, and we're here to help you learn the skills to manage it. I'd like to thank the underwriters of today's event, AO Docs, Box, and Microsoft. Without the support of our solution providers, we wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs like our virtual events and also like our webinars and so many other things that we do here. So thank you very much to our sponsors, and certainly thank you for taking the time to join us today. And like I said, Kevin Crane is our host for our event today. And uh, as you may know, Kevin is a professional writer, an internationally respected technology analyst, and an award-winning podcast producer. And he was named number one, the number one enterprise content management influencer um, to follow on Twitter. And he has listeners and readers worldwide. And here at AIM, in addition to being our content strategist, he is that host and producer and the voice of AIM On Air podcast. So hi, Kevin. Just want to officially welcome you here. Good morning. Hello, Teresa. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello. Um, so what I'm going to do, as I mentioned, um, we have a poll question that we want to launch. And so I'm just inviting everybody to come up to their keyboards right now. And um, Kevin, let me go ahead and launch this first poll. And Please. then I'm going to mute myself off and, and let you take things from there. Because I all right. think this is all going to be pretty fun. Okay. Here. Well, welcome everyone to get us started before we launch into uh, Piggy's keynote. We do have a poll question. And if a song could describe how prepared you are for 2020, what would it be? Would it be Help by the Beatles? Would it be Crazy by Aerosmith? How about I Feel Good by James Brown? Or You Can't Touch This by MC Hammer? If you could describe how prepared you are for 2020 in a song title, which one would it be? I'll give you just a few seconds to, uh, to uh, enter your response into the poll question before we get to Peggy. All right, how are we doing, Teresa? Looks like. Yeah, a lot of great responses in here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Looks like a lot of people are feeling like they're crazy <laughs> or perhaps need some help. So uh, looks like uh, crazy is winning out, 43%. Okay, so looks like we have some work to do here today. <laughs> and we hope that today's session will help us, uh, help us all get our, our uh, perspectives and thoughts straight as we move into 2020. All right, well, let's move on to our keynote today. Thank you, Teresa. It is my pleasure to welcome Peggy Winton to our uh, event today as our keynote speaker. With over 30 years of program, product, and business development experience, Peggy is responsible for the strategic direction, technical direction, and business direction of AIM, and certainly one of today's top thought leaders when it comes to intelligent information ma management. Peggy will join us and share her latest perspectives within the industry that illustrate how intelligent information management has truly become come of age. And she'll help us focus our 2020 vision on 2020 and beyond and explain why we need to take advantage of information driven opportunities and not just mitigate their risks. So with that, Peggy, welcome to our event today. Thank you so much, Kevin. I hope you can hear me all right. Yes, I can. And you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. All right. Hey, that's a great way to start. We're, 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 we're ready to go now. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. We at AIM have done a lot of work with a brand strategist, a brand powerhouse over the year. And you might ask yourselves, why in the heck have you done that? Um, we believe that all of us and all of our organizations our brands that endear ourselves to our customers and our customers' customers. One of the things that our brand strategist friend has told us is that true leaders don't change up their story every year. 
they tell the same story and they perfect that story and they tell that story over and over again. So some of what I'm going to talk about today, you have heard in the past, but I hope we're getting better at telling this story. And I share it with you because I think it's one that you might want to perfect yourself in your own organizations because we are all here with a desire and an objective to ensure that the power of information is well articulated within our organizations and that we explain to our stakeholders that intelligent information management actually can be a key strategic differentiator versus just a cost of doing business. So I'm going to share with you the intelligent information management story as we have come uh, to perfect it and to tell it. And I'm also going to be sharing a few of the most, I think, um, poignant data points from some of the research that we've conducted. And remember, this is research we do with you. So thank you so much if you've taken part in that through the years. Um, we gather, uh, feedback from you on business drivers and your plans for investment, not only in technology, but in practices. We collate all of that information and then we send it back and we hope we do it in a way that provides you with some insight. So many of you know that we spent some time and some cycles describing what we mean by digital transformation and i know some of you are rolling your eyes to say if i never hear that term again um, i will be very very happy um, digital transformation is real and whether you know it or whether you like it or not your organization is on or should be on a digital transformation journey we spent some time describing what we meant by digital transformation in information driven terms. After all, uh, that's the currency in which we play and I dare say many of you do as information professionals. At the very heart of this, at the, the place from which everything else starts, is the drive towards understanding, anticipating, and redefining our customer experiences. And that's internal and external. Uh, customers. We did a lot of uh, research and we brought a lot of the best and brightest at AIM together to talk about what true digital transformation leadership looks like. And one of the things that emerged, one characteristic that emerged was that true digital transformation leaders make it easy to do business with. So what does that mean? I spent a lot of time thinking, what is easy? What is the, uh, is it staples or something that says the easy button? Uh, well, we know there's no such thing, but easy to me means two things. One, the product or service that you're offering can't be lame. In this day and age, it actually has to simplify or enhance your customer's life. Think about Uber and the gift or the service they gave to us, they actually took the friction out of hailing a taxi. Who knew that there was one, but they did. And I think that really defines true disruptors and true leaders. Um, think of a way that your product or service can improve or enhance life. Secondly, we've got to be able to deliver that product or service in a way that our consumer customers demand. I believe that when you think about where to get started, on your own digital transformation journey. You might look at both of those. I don't believe you can do both of those at the same time, meaning I think you can spend a lot of time in cycles on uh, innovation and creativity where the product or service is concerned or delivering the product and services that you already have. Think about that in your own organization and think about what it would take to be uh, easy to work with. If customer experience is the place from which everything starts, this aspiration depends on and it leads to a few other uh, necessary ingredients for digital transformation. One is business agility and innovation. After all, it is in um, pleasing our customers and in giving them things that are gonna enhance their lives where we absolutely have to be agile in our businesses. We've gotta be able to pivot uh, at the drop of a hat. 
We also need that operational backbone in order to make sure that we can deliver our products and services in the way that our organizations and our customers want. Um, asking someone to download a form and fill it out and fax it back to you uh, is, a, is a business killer and a customer experience killer right there. So don't do that. Um, and finally, we have to do all of this by knowing what we have, knowing what we can get rid of. And because of the crazy volume and velocity of our information, we really need to automate it. Uh, we as humans don't do a very good job um, of tagging and uh, categorizing things. So we really need the heft of um, machines if we can. As if that weren't hard enough, um, there are plenty of roadblocks and detours along the way. Uh, if, if digital transformation is a journey and we use a, a sort of road uh, travel analogy, this is the big boulder that falls down the side of the hill. Uh, let's face it, we have already lost our ability to uh, even keep pace with the big data and the amount of information that's swirling around our organizations. Did you know that 60% of that is unstructured? Now, certainly the lines between structured and unstructured have blurred, but the reason why unstructured is so, um, so much of a challenge is that um, it doesn't fit tidily in a database. It's all of that thing uh, that's good stuff in emails, in rich media, uh, in IMs, in, in texts. Um, where a lot of really good customer information lies, lies. So how do we extract that in a way? And how do we do that uh, when the volume of information is expected to grow by five times in just the next two years? No wonder organizations are struggling and no wonder there's such a demand for new practices, new information management practices. We at AIM believe that it really falls into three categories. We need to look at our information ecosystem. Um, and we need to think about how we modernize that. And that doesn't mean just ripping and replace some legacy information. With a lot of uh, new technologies and connectors and APIs, we can get the best of everything. And somebody once said to me that businesses ought to invest in the system or systems that's going to make the biggest impact on the business that they're in. And I believe those have to be uh, the customer facing ones. So sometimes good enough is good enough. Uh, if it's a little ugly on the back end, but your customers are none the wiser, that's okay. That's a reality. I think we need to get rid of this pipe dream of um, a content management system as a single repository to handle everything. We need content that's modular and deliverable in, in chunks. Um, getting information to the business when it needs it and as seamlessly as possible. So this is where AIM can help. And many of you know that it's been about three years since we launched um, the term intelligent information management. That is our practice and it is a practice and methodology. It's not a quadrant, it's not a technology. Um, we believe that following the intelligent information management roadmap uh, will truly get you uh, to your digital transformation journey. And it's got three pieces or services. One is content services and many of our solution providers out there are adopting that term to convey that uh, uh, portability um, and that uh, chunking of content. Again, uh, content should be seamless and it should serve the business application. But these are the things that many of you uh, out there are familiar with. It's the capturing information, it's creating information, it's organizing it and it's sharing it. That's where the collaboration piece comes. And yes, we have to apply some adult supervision uh, to govern that information, but we need to automate it or we will never keep pace with that volume and velocity and craziness. There's also um, two other pieces and I'll go into that in a minute, but I thought these two data points uh, about intelligent capture were really worth paying attention to. Um, I'd focus on the second one, um, how much uh, the focus is now shifting and 68% uh, of you said um, that it's really shifting to a realization that we need to capture information at the point in which it's created. 
remember that the paper you send out is going to come back to haunt you. Uh, so don't do that. And as information comes into your organization, capture it um, at that point and uh, uh, as you're creating it. The second, I think, is really important as we look at the role that intelligent um, uh, capture uh, plays within AI and machine learning. This is a huge and a uh, proven um, uh, application point for AI and machine in the capture side. And you all believe that that is really, really important and that intelligent capture overall uh, has a big, big role to play in your broader digital transformation strategy. No wonder. When we look to uh, governance and we look to things like automated classification, look at what a change in just five years. Um, so many more of you believe that automating the classification is really the only way you're going to keep up with the volume. Look at that change um, from 2014 uh, to what we asked you this year. And I think this is one of the most important data points uh, we can even talk about here. Um, how do you, quote unquote, sell uh, the importance of information governance uh, within your organizations? There's been that discussion for many, many years. Do you take a risk approach or do you take a value and, and a power of information approach? And 36%, which is a huge growth over the last few years, um, have found success in speaking about information governance more obliquely and talking about it as a necessary ingredient um, in a larger product around business process objectives. Think about that and, and think about how you would change um, your own conversations there. I can't stress that enough. On the process services side, we're looking at tools that automate um, what were human driven tasks with the simplicity of an app. You've heard of things like low code and citizen developer. That's simply using new tools that um, are largely declarative. So many of you are, are used to uh, dragging and dropping. That's how a lot of these new uh, process automation tools use. And the objective is to streamline the flow of information within and across your uh, key business processes. Here's some interesting data points on that. Look at the orange bars at the bottom. When we asked you uh, what the most important reasons for even undertaking process automation, uh, you've said it's to improve data quality, data quality. We haven't talked about that a lot, and that's fabulous that you're committing that uh, word data to your vocabulary. It is about the data. Uh, you're trying to improve customer service and reducing manual errors uh, is one way to, uh, to improve customer service. So I think those are all very, very much related and, and look at the focus on the customer. When we asked you to look at those sort of horizontal uh, processes within your organization and where automation can have the most uh, impact, uh, you talk about things like logistics and delivery, um, things like contracts management and invoice processing, and yes, records management and preservation, um, but automation is key there. And finally, analytic services. How do we extract the intelligence about our customers that we need in order to do even better uh, when it comes to uh, that product design and, and creation, as well as um, process improvement, as well as decision making? Uh, and that's extracting insight from information. And now with new tools, it makes it easier to do that at any point in the life cycle. So it is a key driver of uh, machine learning initiatives. Um, this ability to turn unstructured, remember that 60% of information that's swirling around our organizations, to be able to take that unstructured information uh, and turn it into structured data so that machines can truly read it. And here's some interesting cases. Sometimes we talk about it in the abstract and a lot of our users are asking, well, what do you mean by that? What are some of the things that I can do with it? Think about audio recordings that will uh, enable you to translate that to a, a transcript uh, to enable speech recognition. Uh, look at things like uh, transaction data for uh, detecting fraudulent transactions and preventing fraud detection overall.
And we'll make sure that you get a copy of this presentation because I think these will give you some real uh, ideas on where um, within your own organizations you can feel the power and really leverage uh, artificial intelligence for yourself. So we use the word services in all of these three, these three-legged stools of the IIM um, uh, a chair, so to speak. Um, we use the word services to really convey um, that modularity and consumable uh, chunking uh, of information to uh, deliver information to the business, to those line of business owners who are on the front line of the customer uh, when they need it in order to do a particular job. Here's something else I want you to look at and think about how you can perfect some capabilities going forward. When we look at those three um, legs of the stool, content services, process services, analytic services, and we, and we asked you, um, where, uh, where are you now? Uh, what are you viewing as the most important? And where are you gonna be in two years? It's really become clear that the content services piece are almost becoming table stakes in a much larger play uh, around the process and the analytics side. So perfect that. Um, think about how you yourself can become a business analyst when it comes to uh, extracting vital information. And by the way, AIM has a course uh, that can help you with that. It's um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, for, the, for the business analyst, for the non-mathematician uh, or na uh, non-scientist, and I encourage you to investigate that. So in, in closing, um, it really is time to change the conversations. I think we in this organization have spent far too long uh, putting the gate down, talking about control, talking about compliance for compliance sake. It's really time that we change the conversations from hanging on to information uh, to setting it free. After all, that's where the power is. That's where the heft is. That's where we can do some truly great things. Of course, it needs some adult supervision, uh, but we need to let it free, uh, set it free and let it go to work for us. We also need to stop talking about information governance for information governance sake. Uh, talk about it uh, as a necessary ingredient of a larger mission, of a larger project. And we've got lots of fantastic examples of where uh, those successful conversations have taken place and now how they have enabled a better conversation uh, with our customers. So here's how to reach me. And uh, Kevin, I think it's uh, back to you. Uh, we're gonna have a little bit of a conversation before we hear from our, our other uh, presenters. And I apologize for the background. It turns out that uh, the yard people just decided to show up. <laughs> so um, as luck would have it, that's right. Right, it, the, the, the gardener the, the, is the enemy of all podcasters and webinar producers. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> well, Peggy, I really like what you had to say here. Um, and overall, it sounds to me like uh, we're really advocating for a change of conversation, a change of mindset, to recognize not only that information is the currency that drives our organization, but we have to leverage that currency. We, it's, like, it's like having a bank account full of money that you never spend, right? So it's, it's a matter of changing our perspective from just simply governance to governance and strategy. I think that's a really good analogy. Um, certainly, you want to protect that uh, nice wad that you've got in the bank, but sitting there is not going to do any good. Um, uh, you need to invest it, and that's where the compounded growth comes, and I think we have to, to look at it that way. And there's, you know, that we're not really comfortable with that. Um, it's a lot easier to fall back on um, uh, control uh, versus enablement. And we need to, we need to work hard on changing that. Well, it's sort of a legacy. It's, it's been our legacy to, to control and, and avert risk uh, and not necessarily been a legacy to look at, at ways to benefit the operational performance of the organization, boost profit, boost customer experience. These are all things that are dependent upon information. And what I'm hearing is that 2020 is now the time to make your strategic changes. Uh, you know, it occurs to me we're 20 years into a new millennium. And the question really becomes, are we operating with last millennium's mindset, you know? Um, if you had a magic 
crystal ball and you could could wave that crystal ball and and enable uh all of us to do as do something more better if you will with information uh more intelligent uh wh what would it be i might answer it a little bit differently um kevin in all the years we've been talking about digital transformation it was only recently that somebody said peggy how do you get started how do you even get started with it and if i had to um, look ahead and maybe not way out in the future because I don't think any of us can do that. Um, but my hope and my wish for even the next 12 months is that we focus on our mission. To me, that's where you start. What is the mission that your organization is in? Hmm. To me, that's the exciting conversations. Hmm. And then you go backwards from there. Hmm. What is it going to take to achieve your mission? And information is going to be a big part of that. What is it about your information um, that you need to do uh, in order to reach that mission? Right. And, you, and you can't bite off the whole thing at once. There will be different elements and pieces to it. But I find that um, a lot more exciting and I actually find it more approachable to start with the mission first and, and backtrack. And again, I don't think that's something that we do in, in this industry. No. We talk about the mechanics and we talk about, um, uh, you know, all the different pieces of just uh, holding on to our information. It's, it's a lot easier, but I think we need to break out of that. That's right. It's a, it's a long way from the boardroom, from the basement to the boardroom, and it's easy <laughs> to lose sight of, of that, uh, depending on your organization. Have you had any aha moments or revelations as you've met and talked with IIM practitioners over 2019? I have, and we have, and we have talked to some people doing some amazing things. And um, this idea of focusing on the mission is not a, a Peggy Winton idea. It's really come from the conversations that we've had. We've had some uh, panel discussions. We've had some super users come in front of our board of directors and our leadership council. And I am so impressed with the mission critical things that these people are trying to achieve, whether it's in healthcare or it's in um, serving financial customers better or uh, for not-for-profits like, like we are, uh, things that are more charitable and social um, facing. It's, it's, um, it's really inspiring. And that has helped us to work on proof points. How can um, our practice of intelligent information management actually enable that? Um, and again, um, not expecting that our executives or our stakeholders are going to get excited about um, some of the disciplines that we've known for so, so long. Um, one example I use often is um, a member of AIM who was recently with Farmers Insurance and had the opportunity to work on a project that was an in-car diagnostics for driver safety. That's obviously a very big deal for um, car insurance companies these days. But this is an information governance and privacy person who said that if he had gone into that project with his governance hat on, he would have completely missed the opportunity to engage with the customer and have the customer engage with him. He would have completely missed the opportunity to be part of such a cool team. And he went into it that said, I am not working on a privacy or governance project. I'm working on a driver safety project that just so happens to have governance built in. Right. He learned that he wasn't gonna get any attention for that, but he was still a necessary ingredient in a vital project, but a project with a higher, loftier uh, goal. And that I think says it all to me and, and how we need to start talking. Right, and that linkage can really spill over into your personal or your work personal life. I mean, it, it, for all of us, it can be sometimes a challenge to get up in the morning and go to work, especially if you don't feel connected to something bigger, as you mentioned. And here's a way that uh, those of us in the basements of information management can find connection to a bigger mission or a bigger purpose. Um, uh, and and, and in a, as a result, our own efforts and our work life becomes a bit more fulfilling as a result. Oh, absolutely. And to do otherwise is uh, gradual death, in my, uh, in my opinion. It really is. All right. Well, we have AIM 2020 coming up here uh, in just a few 
couple, three months. And I want to ask you about AIM 2020. What can folks expect and look forward to experiencing at AIM 2020 this year? Um, my team and I are working. Uh, we have a promise uh, to folks who come. Uh, we are going to be um, creating our sessions around things like mission criticality and providing more and more proof points and examples of uh, the enablement of information in order to achieve those. And I think we all need help uh, in changing those conversations. And that is our vow to you uh, that with the help of just some of our wonderful friends who are uh, out there in the field and in the trenches and doing fantastic things with their uh, organization's information, we're going to show you uh, how you can be an enabler. And while we're talking about AIM 2020, I want to remind all of us, uh, all of us in attendance here today, that an important deadline for AIM, uh, the AIM conference coming up here on December 20th, the ticket price for admission goes up by $350 on the 20th. So now is absolutely the time to reserve your seat for the conference. And it's easy, just go to aimconference.com and register there. With that, I'd like to say thank you, Peggy, for thank being you. with us this morning, and I appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us today. And thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in and uh, uh, sit back and uh, enjoy the rest of the production. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peggy. All right, well, moving on, let's move to our next presenter today, and that is Tony Bajewski from uh, ADOCS, Director of Business Development at ADOCS. And, Tony is asking us all to take a good hard look at the infrastructure that we're working with and ask the question whether or not we're working with systems that are essentially holding us back or maybe behind the curve. And in his presentation called The Future is Here, but the past won't let go. Tony, welcome to the webinar today. Awesome, thanks a lot, Kevin. Happy to be here. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and present my screen now. You should be seeing that here momentarily. Perfect. So, uh, number one, thank you all for taking some time out of your day. Uh, that was a stellar keynote from Peggy. I'm personally, uh, my brain is just spinning right now and all the great things that she had mentioned. A lot of the things that we talk about with the, the people that we deal with on an information management perspective, but broadly, you know, defining business outcomes. Um, I think that that define the mission uh, point that Peggy made was, was super critical in terms of of how you're approaching all of these problems. And it's actually a big piece of how we're addressing the future. So as Kevin mentioned, uh, the future is here, the past won't let go. I'm Tony Bajewski, Director of Business Development, joining you from a hotel room because that's basically where I live. Um, so today, you know, we'll talk a little bit about AODOX. A lot of you may not have full familiar familiarity with us. That's okay. In the grand scheme of things, we're relatively new. So AODOX is a content services platform. We are built for G Suite. So we're a fully SaaS solution built on top of Google Drive, built in uh, GCP. And for a niche solution, not too bad. 4.5 million active users across 800 organizations worldwide. So we do have an organizational footprint that does cover and span the globe. And we have a support network that supports that as well. Our coverage, of, in addition to being global, is a, is a wide footprint of customer profiles. So the large enterprise, the, the Googles of the world. So they're, they're a great customer of ours, a lot of global manufacturers, but also small organizations, nonprofits, so World Wildlife Foundation, uh, federal, state, and local customers. Uh, one of the key themes here is that they're all using the same version of AODOCS, right? Since we are a SaaS solution, they are using the, the same solution. Uh, and they're, they're solving a wide range of problems, ranging from process, ranging from productivity, ranging from compliance, regulatory needs, uh, records management. They're using one solution to solve all these problems with AODOX. 2019 was a uh, exciting year for us. Um, we were mentioned in the Gardner Magic Quadrant. We were mentioned as a strong performer in the Forrester New Wave. Uh, it's, it's exciting for us because we're, in the grand scheme of things, like I mentioned, relatively small, relatively new. I think we're the only platform in the Magic Quadrant that was founded within the last decade, right? So, you know, we take a lot of pride in that, and I'm super proud of our team for driving uh, these outcomes with these analysts and being able to be recognized as a market leader. It really does mean a lot to us, especially as a solution that's been pretty targeted over the past decade or so. So, enough about us. Let's talk about the overall theme of, of what we're here to, to discuss, and it's, it's 2020, right? The future 
is right here uh, in this industry. You know, going back to when I worked for a previous document management company back in 2012 to 2014, iSeries and AS400 based document management, 2020 was, you know, that was out in the future. That's what we look towards. You know, what, what do we think technology is going to look like out, out in front? Um, Oh, sorry, how the chat window pop up. Uh, so now it's kind of snuck up on us, right? You know, we have holiday shopping around the corner. Right after that is the new year. And then we get to figure out how we remove 19 and rewrite 20 for about three and a half months until we get in that habit. So let's take a second to reflect, right? From a consumer perspective, general technology, 2019, what we have at our disposal right now, I had the option to take an autonomous lift to the Las Vegas Convention Center yesterday. That was a first, and it was pretty cool, right? We're seeing pr uh, practical applications of machine learning and AI in our everyday lives. We are seeing literal bionic limbs being introduced for, for amputees to be you know, just as productive, if not more productive than they were. We're seeing health applications that allow us to be proactive in our health. And then the smart connected home it's no longer a random Disney TV movie from the, the mid 2000s, I think it was, if I remember correctly. If for those of us that might be binging Disney Plus, Alexa, Siri, Google are all vying, vying for you know, a place in our lives and our homes. Hopefully I didn't just create alerts in all of your uh, phones. Uh, but that same methodology has been applied to our technology, right? So Gartner and Forrester have move the definition, right? They've moved the goalposts on us to keep us accountable. So we've gone from document management to enterprise content management to now content services. And this is a major shift for us because we've gone from a methodology five, 10 years ago, too many silos is a bad thing. Now it's commonplace, right? And with open API for systems, we can now connect these systems together. And by doing that, we're going to promote adoption. Uh, we need to address the fact that we are a mobile workforce now Right? We are mobile first for a lot of things. That's why Apple has the screen time app now to make us cognizant of how much time we're spending there. We need to be very dynamic in how we're interacting with our consumers, right? And I say consumers in the sense of consumers of our information, of our files, of our data, whether that's internal or external to the organization. And then how can we leverage a lot of the new emerging tech, right? So the, the intelligent capture that Peggy mentioned, that's a huge thing that we're seeing today with doc understanding AI and vision AI and natural language ML and things of those, of those nature. And then being able to take that tech and kind of redefine our metadata models, right? So how can we automate metadata, remove that burden from users? And then how can we become more dynamic and automated in our process? With this, de with this definition being implemented upon us, on our market, it's holding us accountable, right? And that's something that, that you guys as information managers you need to do the same to your vendors and to, to your business leaders of holding everyone accountable to these new bars that are being established and being cognizant of which direction all these solutions are going, right? So while all this exciting stuff is happening, all these, this great new tech is happening, we do see a common theme. It's why are we so bad at using this technology in our workplace, right? So I think that one common theme that we always hear is work smarter, not harder, but Oftentimes we are still very much working harder than we need to. And it's because we're not taking advantage of a lot of these technology concepts that we're using every single day. So some examples of this search, you know, I've been gone for roughly three weeks. I need to go home and watch the Mandalorian. So when I go home, all I have to do is say, you know, okay, Siri, pull up the Mandalorian. I need to find the latest episode that I need to see. And it's going to pull up on my smart TV, right? If I'm looking for, a document or a file, the way that I'm managing those things in my personal apps is very easy. There's, there's a very low bar to finding these information. How does that work today in your organization? If someone's looking for a document, if someone's looking for a policy document, if someone's looking for a PO, if someone's looking for the latest version of a contract that you're, that you're negotiating, is that easy? Is that as optimized as it should be? Chances are it's a no. It's, it's a no for a lot of the customers that we work with on a daily basis. And that's okay, but that's, that's why we're here, right? From a process perspective, are you still using email for approvals? Are you still using paper? Are you using Slack, right? How are you getting things done on a day-to-day -day basis? Are you using tools that were not purpose-built for process to manage your processes? We see that a ton, right? And how is that impacting your organizational optimization? And then how about integration, right? I've got a handful of apps on my phone. Most of them work together, right? If I open up 
uh, Twitter and I want to share it with something. It's a very seamless experience for me to send that to a group text. How does that work in your organization today? Is data and content flowing as it should between applications from one of the easiest low hanging fruit opportunities for automation, right? Systems integration. If you are doing it, was it heavily reliant on technical debt with middleware and custom applications? We see that a ton, right? So how can we adopt principles and open platforms that promote integration between our business systems, that promote free flowing data, obviously in a compliant and governed way, but how can we promote those types of things? And then the most important thing from my perspective is user adoption, right? If we have strong user adoption, that means that we work and live in a compliant environment in a lot of cases. But if I go home and I go buy a smart TV or I buy a new iPad, someone doesn't send a change management expert to my home to teach me how to use this. You know, granted, I'm still using teaching my mom how to use some internet solutions as a retiree, but that's just not how things work. Things are designed to be intuitive today. And that consumerization of IT is a theme that we're constantly seeing. Things should be user friendly. That that shouldn't be some you know wild concept when it comes to enterprise IT and enterprise governance solutions and workflow solutions. But it still is very much a thing. And one of the common threads here is that legacy systems are still in play. Legacy systems have been an inhibitor to adoption, to modernization. Uh, they open risk because a lot of people don't know what that end result is, right? So by moving forward, we really need to address that elephant in the room. And it is these legacy systems that are so very intertwined into our day-to-day -day at work. So an example of this, if we look at 2002 tech, I cannot believe this was 17 years ago. Uh, I think I owned every single one of these devices, right? Everything at that moment was purpose built, right? We had an MP3 player. I had a Nokia so I could play Snake. If my dad had a Palm Pilot, I had a massive laptop. You know, I thought uh, mini disc was the future. Um, boy, was I wrong on that front. But th these technologies were purpose built for that time, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. So if we look back again at that same period, and I don't want to pick on Documentum, but they're going to be an example here. 2002, Documentum version five, the web, web solution at the time designed, purpose built uh, to work in that environment. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but a common thing that we see consistently is that people are still using these technologies that are built for legacy infrastructure. And because of that, you get a legacy solution and a legacy user experience. That's a major inhibitor to adoption and to business optimization in now 2019, soon to be 2020. So how can we take advantage of these things, right? We have to move away from legacy. And Peggy hit this on the head. It is a complete mindset shift, right? So the three keys that we're going to focus on, that first one is that mindset shift. You have to modernize the way that you're looking at the big picture. Align your mission, your organizational mission with your mission to replatform, to modernize, right? We're talking to customers that look at us and they say, okay, well, how do we do this migration? We have 70 servers that support our existing content management infrastructure. And at AODOCS, we've never had a server. We are a completely serverless environment. And they look at us like, okay, space man, like this is science fiction. We can't really wrap our heads around this, this massive of a leap in technology. And what we really want them to focus on is focus on those outcomes, right? Think about those business outcomes. Think about the content. Think about the touch points. Think about the customer experience because all of those are going to be key to aligning that with the technology that will get you there, right? Which systems does it need to talk to? Think about your overall cloud strategies. Think about your hybrid strategies. What is going to be on cloud? What is going to be on-prem? How are you shifting from CapEx to OpEx? These are all questions that you need to be very intentional in asking the entire business about. But one of the great things about this is information management can be a key driver in these outcomes because embedding governance in these solutions is gonna increase adoption, it's gonna increase business outcomes, right? Second, migration. One of the more important pieces, obviously, is bringing this information over, right? So a lot of customers call us and they say, hey, you know, we've got a compelling event happening, we need to migrate as quickly as possible. Our VP of services has got a great way to look at this and he says, hey, if you're getting ready to move and you've lived in a house for 15 years, do you call a mover and just say, hey, I need a quote, and then that's the end of it? No because you know that mover is going to put your kitchen stuff in your foyer you know you don't want to leave them just at will to pack how they want to pack and move how they want to move it's a very intentional process but it is a great moment to reevaluate and to assess right is our content metadata profiling strategy what we want it to be 
how have our users and roles progressed since our last technology refresh, right? Um, how does that integrate with our current IAM or an IAM strategy moving forward? What does it need to integrate with moving forward? How can we streamline and automate by integrating into the system where previously the user was reliant? And then what are we doing with custom applications? What are we doing with custom, uh, custom apps that have been built on top of or independent of content systems and how does governance come into play? And then how can we eliminate that technical debt moving forward? Finally, use, right? Adoption. If people are using the solution, and the solution has governance as a key component of it, it means that we're living in a compliant environment. Adoption should be one of the key focuses. How are we collaborating? What risk does collaboration potentially introduce? So how can we embed governance around real-time collaboration, keystroke versioning, things like that? Is it simple to set up? Can we leverage templating, right? Where can we use process engines to, to accelerate outcomes, right? So think about the use. Think about when users need to interact with information, when they need to interact with data, think about how they work, what their job is, think about what their primary devices are. Because in a lot of cases, you know, our core focus at AODOX as a content services platform is to be persistent without being intrusive, right? 80% of your workforce should probably never know that they're in a document management system or a content services platform, right? And that's the type of environment that you should be thinking about because they don't necessarily have to log in to be in a, in a compliant environment. So that's pretty much it. The future is here. Let's take advantage of it. Let's be very intentional about investing in solutions that are gonna help you guys modernize and, and address broad organizational outcomes. So to recap, take advantage of this technology. Be very, very intentional in evaluating these solutions. Be very intentional about removing that burden of legacy, right? The, the infrastructure that comes with it, the overhead that comes with it, the, the lack of uh, basically alignment with net new technology decisions around cloud, right? And avoiding incongruent technology. And then understand those three keys to moving forward, right? So rethinking, migrating, and then focusing on use. So for more information, aodox.com, find me, stalk me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to talk about this. Super passionate about this industry. I, even though I said I was gonna walk away from it a handful of years ago, but now I'm madly in love with it again. So um, now I'll go ahead and hand it back to Kevin and stop my share here. Thank you. That's Tony Bajewski uh, from AO Docs. Now, Tony, I really get what you're saying about um, legacy systems and, and, the, and the opportunities that are, or the risks that they may present. If I move to a new system now, though, don't I just find myself in the same position five or 10 more years down the road with another, you know, legacy system? It's very easy to fall into that trap, Kevin. That's a great question. Um, one of the easiest ways to avoid it is being very intentional with the migration, right? And the evaluation of your vendors. Because if you're, if you're hyper-focused on a move in a short amount of time, in all likelihoods, you're not going to be really focused on the future. You're just focused on lifting and shifting information, right? So that's a key component by itself. Secondary to that is really pressing your vendors to make sure that they have a path forward, right? What is their five-year plan? Where do they see the market going? What are they focused on? What are they doing to lead the market, right? So for us, you know, we're heavily focused on AI and ML initiatives to increase automation. So you should be partnering with a vendor that aligns with your organizational mission. It aligns with the platform as a service that you've invested in. It's aligning with your cloud technology that you've invested in. So if you, if you look at those areas, you can be confident that you're investing in a track that is going to grow and evolve over time and not get you into the same problem five years from now, right? Well, I know I don't like change. <laughs> I don't think most people like change. Um, and I like, I have a tendency to use things well past their, you know, expired <laughs> date. You know, you should see my cell phone, right? <laughs> <laughs> but how, how old is old? How long should software last? So, it's an interesting question because I think that whole definition has changed in the last five years, especially with the advent of SaaS, right? Because a lot of the technology isn't legacy infrastructure based. And that was one of the key drivers in aging out of software, right? If the infrastructure aged out, the software aged out, are you having to do full infrastructure refreshes? <clears throat> if you know, we work a lot in the regulated industry, how cumbersome are validations of the software? On a, on a timely basis, those would all be key drivers in saying that a software is out of date, right? Also the user experience, right? If your software isn't driving 
that user experience. It's not moving forward. It's not looking for the best way to increase that, that user experience. You're probably invested in a software that, that is old, right? So, you know, I think if you start to see those things drop, I think user adoption would be a great indicator of that. You know, how is, how is adoption scaled over time? Did we see a drop off? Are we seeing growth? Is the, is the vendor constantly reevaluating what they want to develop and how that user experience needs to look? I think that's a, a really easy way to figure out if that software is aging out. And then obviously if you make a massive platform shift, so if you move from Microsoft to G Suite or G Suite to Microsoft, that could be a major indicator of your, your software being old for your organization, right? Because it may still work for other people, but it might be old for you in that sense. All right. I may know all of this or feel all this myself, but I've still got to sell it, right? I've got to, I may not be in a position of making the decision myself. I might need to advocate up to my C-suite level or my director level for the investment in the change and the investment in time and effort and, and so forth. And I think that's where a lot of folks struggle um, is actually getting change implemented. What is one success technique that you've seen your clients use that have helped them build that broader coalition and get the support that they need to actually move forward? Absolutely. So I think, again, Peggy nailed this point and it's starting with the mission, right? Starting with the outcomes and then aligning, number one, making sure the technology aligns with that and then two, building the business case around it, right? So for us, we, we've been very unique in helping our customers build those compelling reasons of why to make such a, a significant move. Uh, and for us, we are very focused on those outcomes, right? So a great example of this is we're working with a customer that manages a lot of warranty claims. So, you know, what were their five key pillars in 2020 for the next five years? Heavily focused on customer experience, heavily focused on integrator experience, heavily focused on obviously sales and revenue. Um, and then their inventory because they, they manufacture things. So warranty claims, that, that file itself, number one, it has governance concerns around it easily because you, you have retention that has to be applied to those things. But we figured out what those touch points were with those five pillars. And we said, okay, there's a lot of data at play here. Obviously metadata, there's, there's process data that our system is going to be able to manage for you from a workflow perspective. There's an intelligent capture concept that exists today. So they're using IBM DataCap. If they move to something like uh, doc understanding AI within the Google cloud platform, what advantages are they going to get? And for them, it's, you have all this data and then you have the white space that exists within the data, the correlations, right? How is that going to help drive business outcomes? If your warranty claim information from a customer perspective is at play, how does that impact them? If let's say a storm is coming up the East coast, what are they doing to proactively send that information out to a customer to let them know that they're thinking about them, right? Customer adv advocacy. So it's really branching out just purely from the content data aspect of it, the governance aspect of it, because so many other aspects of the business are involved in the content services world, whether they realize it or not, getting them to that awareness and aligning it with the mission, you now create a significant compelling event to say, this is the way that our business wants to go, right? This, this perfectly aligns with our five-year, 10-year plan. And you gave us a technology that's going to really connect all these dots and connect these touch points and, and uh, you know, drive customer experience, revenue, make sure that it's a compliant environment, all of these things, right? So you're a key focus in putting together that message. And we've seen it, we've seen it uh, work with, with great success with our customers being able to sell that to their boards and to their executives. So it's a two-step process. First, understanding what that mission and vision is on a, say, a five-year basis from a business point of view and really understanding that, you know, we're in the, we're in the business of X and this is how we make money, or this is a significant, we used to call them blue chips, blue chip goal that, that we need to achieve as a company. And then looking at the things that we advocate for, or we'd like to advocate for change or implement from a technology point of view and looking for that linkage and really speaking that language as how we describe what we're about instead of always looking at it necessarily from a technical point of view. Exactly. And from my perspective, content services is a line of business system, right? Whether or not it's the, the primary pane of glass, you know, that's to be decided by the, the persona of the user. But being microservices and API based, we are going to be that glue between the ERP, the HRMS, the CRM, uh, the ticketing software, and making sure that the data and the content is flowing through each touch point in a compliant governance, uh, you know, 
happy environment, if you will. And that's gonna make governance people happy because you've set the baseline system to where it's embedded. It's a part of the process, right? You don't have to worry about marrying compliance to shadow IT, which is something that is hopefully avoidable for everyone. On Another this webinar. subject. <laughs> but yeah, you know, getting them, getting the, the buyers to understand that this is a key cog in tightening that IT infrastructure and the flow of content and data and the associated touch points. Hmm. You know, it, it's it's true. It is it is very much a line of business system, um, but it's it's more embedded than pane of glass like a, okay. a SAP or an Oracle. I like that the glue. So as we look forward to 2020, you might look and see how we can be the glue that holds all of these pieces together: the technical pieces, the strategic pieces, the people pieces, the workflow pieces, the governance pieces, and the opportunity pieces. I mean, really, if you think about it. Uh, We've got to be that glue to move us forward. Well, thank you, Tony Machuski from AODocs, Director of Business Development at AODocs. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thanks a ton, everyone. All right. Very good. Well, let's move ahead to our third speaker today. And I am so pleased, and especially uh, now, we've a great follow up speaker to Tony, and that is Rand Wacker, Head of Industry Solutions at Box, and you know, without a doubt, the cloud is now how we manage content, we manage uh, information these days. It gives us great flexibility, new capabilities, but it's also brought with it some new complexities and risks and challenges, and Rand is here to talk about how to simplify how you work with cloud content management. Rand, welcome to the event today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rand Wacker with Box, and I'm very excited to be here today to share our perspective on where intelligent information management is going uh, in the in the next year or so. Um, my role at Box is is working with our industry solutions team. I we're responsible for walking through basically from a vertical by vertical basis where Box can help people. Uh, uh, adapt to digital transformation and to change the way that their users and their teams are building new business processes. In addition to Box, I also serve on the board of directors for AIM, um, which I've done for the past couple of years, and I'm uh, very happy to be a, a member of the AIM tribe and, and working with all of you. So jumping into it, I wanted to uh, tell the story really of where Box is looking at cloud content management as a part of, of intelligent information management um, and the problems we're trying to solve for customers. So um, at the outset, our mission is to really power how the world works together. Um, and working together is also really involves information. And so we believe that information and collaboration amongst teams um, is critical to helping organizations uh, really speed up their processes in this new digital world. And we see many of our customers who are focused on trying to, to reinvent their IT stacks in order to enable this. Because the challenge that many companies see is that you know, over the years, the evolution of our, our IT systems has uh, created a very complicated system that's made work just way more complex than it needs to be. Um, you know, sometimes something as simple as sharing a document outside of your organization, even inside your organization, can be a real pain and can really slow down what you're trying to do. So we see that, that work overall uh, needs to be rethought in this digital age. And with that, every company we've talked to has, has really three core ideas. Um, again, the, the processes that they're running, whether it's a, a simple exchange of information or a multi-step, multi-party process, really depends on people both inside and outside your organization. This is you, this is your partners, this is your customers, um, really people all throughout the spectrum, it, it's no longer delineated by the, the walls of the office you work in. The second is that most companies are rethinking their IT stack um, and going with a, a cloud-first uh, strategy where individual tools such as Microsoft Office, such as Slack, such as Salesforce become the, the core of their IT stack and their users are, are demanding applications like that to work together. And then finally, as we would always expect, security, compliance, and especially these day, days privacy um, are top of mind for everyone. But the question is, how do you address those issues without burdening the user experience and, and slowing things down again? 
So we believe that solving these issues and simplifying work is really uh, about understanding one of the, the hidden assets and, and a core capability that passes between all of them. And this, uh, you know, for the AIM community is, is very clearly near and dear to our hearts. Um, it's around content, not just the, the regulated records content that you have to keep track of, but of course um, really anything that's going around the organization that requires collaboration, that requires workflow, that requires security um, is a really key strategic asset. And just to focus on that last one, we're seeing more and more that um, many companies have even much more very sensitive content moving to the cloud than ever before. Um, we're seeing a, a lot of organizations who used to be unsure of how they could leverage the cloud actually starting to use cloud services for some of their most important processes because it speeds things up. Um, let's take life science as an example, a space where we've had a long presence of information management and content management for drug trials, for R&D, for the manufacturing process and everything. These days with the, the outside collaboration with other research organizations, um, with uh, doctors and labs that are, that are doing testing, even with the regulatory agencies themselves, sharing critical information is, is critical and that must be done securely and it must be done in a way that meets the needs of GXP and other life science certifications. Banking and financial services is another one where clearly information and the regulatory requirements of FINRA and SEC regulations must be maintained no matter who you're sharing uh, information with. But then just look at maybe retail as an example. Um, people that are building uh, new consumer goods, people that are opening new stores, um, they have a huge amount of critical and sensitive IP that they're using, whether it's manufacturing plans, whether it's uh, distribution information, or even marketing campaigns. And so all of these are examples of sensitive content that people are moving to the cloud because it speeds up what they have to do and they have to think about the security of those overall. So the challenge is that very often we're not necessarily thinking about how this content is being used and secured um, and managed across all of it. What we see very often is a jumble of systems that is leading to user confusion, um, that is leading to gaps in governance, um, and that is, that is leading often to process breakdowns and sometimes security risks. I, I think you know, every IT team that I talk to and every compliance team that I talk to see a slide like this and they, they say that they wish their world was, was actually that simple. Um, everyone has everything from our legacy network file shares, um, sharing information through email, even still people are using physical file cabinets for retaining important records such as employee records and whatnot. All of that definitely needs to be put somewhere where it's more manageable, more accessible, um, and more secure. But then we have the evolution of ECM systems um, and a lot of the tools that were designed for really key processes in an organization have um, gotten very deeply embedded in some of those processes, but they haven't kept up with the new demands, whether it's the need to create custom web applications or mobile applications for your customers to use, or just being able to extend those processes to, to other outside the company um, is something where, where these systems have not necessarily kept up. Um, this gave rise to the file sync and share space, which is uh, an area where Box is well known because um, we have been the leader in this space for a long time. Uh, to be quite honest though, we're solving problems across this entire spectrum um, as opposed to just the, the collaboration space overall. And the last two ones are really interesting because people don't often think about these as new areas for uh, content to, to get stored and, and possibly to, to create new um, governance risks or information management risks. But a lot of new applications getting built in um, cloud platforms like AWS or Azure, um, these are often a place where corporate information will be stored, client information will be stored, and needs to be taken into account for your overall information management plan, as well as many of the new SaaS applications that are people are rolling out, um, which will have their own repositories as well. So this is just a simplified version of the, the hodgepodge of systems that we're using for a variety of collaboration, workflow, and security, and often um, none of them are interacting well with each other, which is causing a lot of problems for why work is so complex these days. So 
our belief is that in order to, to help solve these problems, we all must think about simplifying the, the content strategy in organization so that work can uh, get untangled and that we can use content as a strategic asset to, to tie everything together. So there's three main things that, that we think about and that we encourage all of you to think about um, when you're working on your content strategy going into, into next year. The first is that collaboration has to be seamless. It has to be as easy to work with someone who is outside your organization as it is with someone down the hall. And, and seamless this means also that the security has to be baked in so that it can't get in your way. Compliance needs to be taken care of, privacy and GDPR regulations need to be taken care of, but that shouldn't be something that requires users to go through so many hoops that they won't use your tool and they'll default to sending it over, uh, over email or, God forbid, mailing it on a USB drive or something like that. So the collaboration aspect is, is really key and it's something that, that we've always found um, customers to, to first and foremost be thinking about when they're, they're going to the cloud. A good example of this is Morgan Stanley. Uh, Morgan Stanley has worked with Box for a number of years now uh, for collaboration inside the organization and outside the organization. Very interestingly, they built a whole new customer experience where individual clients at Morgan Stanley are able to access their sensitive information that's, that's stored and protected by various SEC regulations through a, a custom web portal or a mobile interface. This is actually using Vox on the back end for enforcing all the FINRA regulations. It's their own custom portal um, on the front end that users are collaborating with, but then the internal teams are collaborating both amongst themselves as well as with outside partners like lawyers uh, and accountants through the, the standard box interface as well. So really interesting uh, use case where they're using Box as a platform for basically three-party collaboration between their clients, their advisors, and outside parties. The second area that we think that people need to think about in a cloud-first world um, for content is how do you integrate you, all of your different applications uh, to better streamline how work gets done. And what we mean by this is, is all of the new best-of-breed tools that are coming out out there, Slack, Office 365, um, all these different systems, Workday, ServiceNow, um, are allowing people to you know, have a much better experience for certain types of tasks, but it creates these silos of information um, that are disconnected from each other. So another customer of ours, for example, is using Box to actually connect to all of these different applications um, and have a single content layer across all those systems. A good example is they may be storing customer contracts in Salesforce um, and organizing things by client and, and renewal date and all of that. But then that information can be automatically surfaced and edited in Microsoft Office or it can be shared through Slack. And the, it's never duplicates of the file moving around. It's, it's one file in one place, which allows for much better information management over time. Um, and this is just one example of, of thousands and thousands of customers that are using over 1,400 different types of integrations uh, directly in Box for their, their core content. And then finally, from a security perspective, you need to think about how are you protecting your information in a way that doesn't uh, get in the user's way or put up roadblocks that causes people to go around. Very often we've seen people rolling out compliance and, and security tools that are bolted on that get in the way of the user experience and simply are just are not used in the way they're intended, leading to more risk and, and more issues. And so one of my favorite examples here, uh, which is one people may not think of from a security perspective, but um, Nike as an example has used Box for a number of years to protect their most sensitive data in their designs, in their R&D, manufacturing, marketing, and, and finance departments. Um, really interesting use cases because um, clearly they have, they have teams which are not necessarily um, thinking about data privacy and data security in the forefront, um, and so they've had to educate people in the, the best way to do this and, the, and what fits in with their day-to-day um, their -day workflow. 
Um, and so of all the customers I've worked with over the years, Nike is easily in the, the top 10 of the most security conscious companies I know. Um, and they've done that in a way which really enables the users to make the right choices so that they're not worried about um, accidental leakage of information, as an example. And so summarizing these areas overall, you know, when, when you're thinking about your strategies for intelligent information management and what you're doing over the next couple of years in your content strategy, definitely focus on making sure that collaboration is seamless for internal parties, external parties, uh, whoever you're connected. Make sure that you, your content strategy includes integrating all of these best of breed tools um, and applications that can integrate how um, everything works together and gives your users the choice that they're looking for. And then make sure that the security you're using is baked in and, and helps, helps enable users to make the right choices as opposed to getting in their way. The way that most customers think about Box is it is a content services layer across all of your different applications, whatever type of system you're using, whether it's in productivity, whether it's team communication collaboration, many of these line of business applications, or even some of your infrastructure and enterprise applications, Box plugs into to your entire infrastructure um, and provides a, a single platform for that, that content security um, and content collaboration use cases. So, Wanted to thank everyone very much for their time today. We do have um, a time for Q&A now, and we will go ahead and, and go to some of the questions. So thank you very much. All right, very good. That is Rand Wacker from Box. And uh, Teresa, I understand we have Rand with us now. Is that correct? Should Rand, do, are Kevin. you with us? I think this is me. Yes, hi. Hello, Rand. Hello. Me? It's great to hear you. Good to talk to you. Fantastic. I really love what you had to say about creating this content layer or content services layer over uh, different apps and different repositories. Um, I think, and you talked a lot about security, but I think first and foremost on everyone's mind is how do I protect that, that information, especially as diverse and widespread as it might be, uh, say from being sent to the wrong person or the wrong outside person? How does it work with Box? Yes, well, I think one of the um, most important things when you're talking about security is being able to uh, help guide the users in making the right decisions and, and how information should be shared and with whom, um, making it very easy to identify and classify information as sensitive, um, to, to have policies uh, which can be enforced uh, based on that, that classification and, and do it in a way so that the user doesn't have to map a certain type of information to a certain type of protection, but they can just focus on if I'm working with, you know, sensitive financial information, um, it is uh, it is, is classed as such, and therefore the right policies are uh, enabled. Um, additionally, you know, having the users be guided to making the right decision is, is one part, but then being able to proactively monitor and see what type of uh, information is being shared and with whom, and, and even proactively identify uh, potentially information that uh, uh, needs to be protected in a different way is, is something that uh, we've done with a, a number of both our own tools and with partners. The other thing I found very interesting uh, was the story of Morgan Stanley. And it really sounds like they are doing some really wonderful things in terms of their information agility that then speaks to what we were talking about earlier in, in the program today, not looking at just the governance point of view, but also the strategic or the opportunity point of view. So tell me the process of building an app like that, say for case management. Um, what, what are the steps of the process that I might go through to build a, a case management app, something or, or a service app, something similar to, um, to Morgan Stanley? Yeah, that was a really interesting story because what Morgan Stanley wanted to do was to build effectively a new uh, portal for their clients, um, for their, their high net worth uh, customers where they could share uh, sensitive information through a Morgan Stanley branded portal. And on the back end, they were using Box uh, as, the, as the, the content service, which uh, helped them do all of the, the rendering, uh, keep all of the, the metadata information, and most importantly, apply the, the retention rules so they'd stay SEC compliant. Um, so clients of theirs would see uh, a custom Morgan Stanley interface, which um, 
let them control the uh, experience and, and make sure that it was tied into all their other systems. While on the back end, the, the Morgan Stanley advisors actually were, were interacting directly through the, the Natabox interface, um, being able to access and share the customer files, and even uh, using Box to collaborate with um, outside teams. Maybe they were tax accountants or, or trust lawyers uh, to make it very easy to have a team working together, whether they're part of Morgan Stanley or an outside team. But then the client was accessing everything through the, um, you know, the, the very curated Morgan Stanley experience. So I want to ask, um, why did Morgan Stanley do that? It, uh, in other words, what, what was the strategic goal that they were trying to attain by, through that effort? Or, or how did that drive company performance in ways that rang all the bells at the C-suite level for performance metrics? Yes. Um, and, and they've actually, there's a, a number of stories on the web about what they've been doing to try to drive a new digital experience. We actually had their um, head of digital he, here uh, speaking and, and talking about, you know, in their case, they looked at the, the normal financial process, whether it's, you know, the fact that if you're dealing with loan applications, you've got so much paperwork and they're expecting you to email and fax and do those kinds of things. You know, she, it was really funny because she was here and she was talking about that experience she had had. And she's like, this is why I have a job. I have to make this a new modern experience. Um, and we have to do something that's going to, to better serve our clients. So, so their, their directive from the top has been to create these new digital experiences for their customers in order to improve customer service. Uh, to speed up the, the processes and to, um, in, in the long run, actually save money for themselves. They were moving from essentially a paper-based process to a digitally-based process in the, all of this as well? I think I, in a lot of cases, the back end often is, is run digitally, um, but it was on old technology, which didn't allow the collaboration, for example, with outside parties. Um, it was, uh, it did rely on paper as sort of the, the intake of it. Um, and so they wanted to reimagine the experience end to end, not just to put a digital face on an existing process, but to rethink the process from the ground up. So really a good example that is within the theme of our event today, what's your vision for 2020? Here, here we have Morgan Stanley that clearly at that C-suite level felt that it was time or critically important to spend the money and the effort. And I can't imagine that it must have been an expensive and, and complex undertaking um, from the very beginning, at least uh, decision process wise. Uh, but they, they have then found that this transition, a more digitally uh, enabled uh, operating way of, way of operating was essential now in moving uh, into the 21st century. Do you see other, say, organizations in the financial industry coming about with the same sort of strategic mindset now? Well, uh, we see that across uh, organizations in, in really every industry um, where, you know, every, uh, every company is trying to rethink the way that they're interacting with their consumers and the way that they're, um, they're enabling their employees uh, to get work done internally and externally. So, you know, we've seen, a, as AIM has been talking about for a long time, the, the theme of digital transformation uh, is definitely, you know, hitting everyone overall. And it just depends on what are they doing, whether it's a case like, you know, many of the, the banks that are trying to streamline that, that bank to, to client process, whether it's, uh, you know, e-commerce and retail companies, like I talked about, that are uh, trying to change both their supply chain and, chains and the, uh, how they're selling to their, their customers, life sciences, companies uh, speeding up their research to bring new drugs to market. Um, everyone's taking advantage of, of uh, using digital to, to really speed up the processes and, and collaborate across boundaries. Well, very good. All right. That is Rand Wacker. Rand is head of industry solutions at Box. Rand, thank you so much for being part of our event today. Thanks, Kevin. Nice to talk to you. All right. Very good. Well, Moving right along, let's move to another video presentation brought to us from Microsoft with Chris McNulty, a senior product manager. Chris will be with us also after this video um, to answer some questions, but he's here to give us some information about Project Cortex, a new commercial service in Microsoft 365 that applies AI to automatically organize your content. 
and is sure to be noticed in 2020. So let's see that video from Chris now. Hi, welcome to today's presentation from Microsoft as part of the AIM virtual event, Project Cortex, your knowledge network in Microsoft 365. I'm Chris McNulty, Senior Product Manager for Content Services in Microsoft 365. Let's begin by talking a little bit about what is Microsoft 365. Microsoft 365 is the world's productivity cloud. And when we launched it two and a half years ago, it began as a simpler way to be able to purchase Windows, Office 365, and mobility and security. However, over the years, we've evolved it to being a converged offering that brings together the best of our capabilities, more tightly coupled than ever before, helping you achieve more. We have commitments to deliver solutions around collaboration, workflow, and security. And as we've announced earlier this year, we are now committed to helping organizations achieve more with knowledge. Knowledge is a broad range of offerings. It includes capabilities from workplace analytics, stream, search, and Yammer, but it is headlined by Project Cortex. Our commitment to this is based on a rock solid foundation of content services headlined by SharePoint as an offering inside Microsoft 365. And when we think about the reasons why it's time to pay attention to this now, we know that the time pressures are considerable in organizations. The amount of unstructured data exploding in the world is really hard to manage. <clears throat> and AI has moved to the forefront of a way to try to cope with this scale. When we decided to invest heavily in knowledge and content services as part of the reinvention with Project Cortex, we did it on a foundation of core capabilities around managing documents at scale throughout SharePoint libraries, our information governance solutions for retention and sensitivity, as well as capabilities with search and with publishing. And these investments we have seen recognized by the marketplace. When we look at the Gartner Content Services Magic Quadrant, uh, Microsoft has been a leader for three years running, and in every successive year, we've improved our standing. That is due in no small part to our customers who have committed to the platform and are happy to talk to Gartner and to the industry about their successes with it. But we're on a journey and we've uncovered that there's, we can do more with content than just manage it, but we can harness it to be able to tap into knowledge. As we have been on this journey, we've uncovered many needs organizations have around information protection and integration. And as we've been talking to customers, we've realized that it is time to be able to address problems people have with finding information, with surfacing knowledge as it exists in their organization, and maintaining high quality information as people cycle through the workforce. It's estimated that nearly $9 million can be saved at a typical company by improving the time to effectiveness of new hires by just one week. We take that to heart when we talk to our customers who have been piloting our new Project Cortex solution with us. Mott McDonald is a global engineering firm, and they believe not just in ROI, but in the power of connected thinking, helping people get connected to knowledge and connecting knowledge to people. They believe that with the right use of knowledge technologies, including Project Cortex, that they can massively expand their book of business while remaining on the same headcount for years to come. We appreciate the support and guidance from Mott McDonald along with all of our steering committee customers, which has led us to our core belief. Understanding the pace of change in the world and the difficulty at finding the right skilled talent, helping the people you already have tap into that knowledge, improve their skills and learn faster is the key way to stay competitive in today's marketplaces. That's why we're happy to introduce Project Cortex, your knowledge network in Microsoft 365. Project Cortex is organized around three core sets of values. The first is around manageability. Many workloads today have stayed away from Office 365 because we haven't offered the sort of transactional scale. With Project Cortex, you'll be able to store tens of millions of documents in a single content repository and integrate remote services such as file shares, SQL Server, MediaWiki, using our search technologies to be able to enrich the information we have that's available to you. 
if you're going to bring millions and billions of documents in, you don't have time to read all of those. So that's why Project Cortex has also expanded our content services offering with an AI-powered solution for recognizing, capturing, and classifying information. So we can see things that look like a resume or a purchase order and not just identify it, but pull out the key metadata, the dates, the facts, the figures, the people, the customers, and the summaries, so we can add those as rich tags. And finally, being able to enrich the information through the apps that people are already using as a way of delivering knowledge that unlocks what people need to know to get their jobs done. Project Cortex will be coming in the first half of 2020, and let's take a quick look at some of the things that are going on with it. We begin by looking at our knowledge experiences throughout Microsoft 365. Let's begin by taking a look at an experience most of us have inside Outlook. I've joined a new project and I've received an email from one of my team members. And there's a reference here in the email and if you look at it, it looks a little different. It's a reference to CORE. That's an acronym I'm unfamiliar with. If I hover over that, I'm going to be introduced to a topic card. This topic card was mined for my content and built using AI. It pulls together everything we know about this topic, the acronym, the summary, the key people to go to for more information, file resources that I might want to understand, as well as related topics and details about this project. If I tap into the card, I'm going to be introduced to the topic page. This is a fully immersive view that pulls together everything that we know about this particular topic, both built with AI as well as things that are curated by my experts. I get a summary overview. I get a view of the key people and experts that I can go to for more information. Files that those experts have added, as well as files that the system has automatically discovered for me. I can get to related sites and containers and also see a map of related topics. We see all the knowledge and content in your organization coming together in what we're terming the knowledge network. That's the interrelationship between people, their work practices, and the content. And we mean more than just traditional files and PDF documents, but content are in, is increasingly digital. It includes conversations, it includes email, chat, audio, and video files as well, as well as a broad range of third-party solutions that have adopted the Microsoft 365 framework. Here I see the relationship amongst all of my topics, how I can see what relates most closely to Project Sort, um, to Mark 8, and how they tie back to the construction operations reliability engagement. We also pull information from our conversation platforms, Yammer and Teams, helping people understand in context what kinds of questions other people have had and help them contribute to their own um, knowledge by adding details here. Now that knowledge center itself and that knowledge network are essential for us at being able to help me find other projects that I might want to go to for related information as I'm charting my own journey from learning from the practices that have come before me. And I can also roll all that information up to the knowledge center. This is a top level experience across Microsoft 365. Using Microsoft Graph, I'm presented with the primary topics that are going to be most relevant to me, along with a view of my own profile. Where have I contributed? What am I recognized as an expert for? What are the topics I own and the topics I follow? As well as questions that are being proposed for me and suggested content based on my interaction with the topics and the people around them throughout my organization. The Knowledge Center, like the rest of Project Cortex, is a customizable experience and we'll be shipping a suite of parts allowing you to bring information together in from sources like LinkedIn Learning, from the Knowledge Network, from Workplace Analytics and the rest, both to augment your Knowledge Center as well as to provide a broad range of tools helping you take that and embed it into any application page inside Teams, inside Yammer, making sure that the information is shared as it's needed, where it needs to be found. So the second major part of our journey is how do we organize information and understanding inside of that graph. It's important to remember that you will have control of how topics are generated in your organization. You can see the generation of topics by uploading term lists, acronyms, definitions, and by using our taxonomy services in managed metadata. 
you, there's a rich range of things I can do to manage topics, to add security and control the visibility, as well as shaping where Project Cortex looks to find knowledge inside of my organization. It can look as widely or narrowly as you need it to based on your needs. And lastly, let's talk about how information comes in and is managed in the first place. Project Cortex integrates a range of AI solution, helping me find objects that are inside of my digital files by pulling OCR out or recognizing thousands of possible things it can see inside video and pictures. We'll also introduce a forms processing engine, allowing you to pull metadata out from structured documents, as well as file classification for unstructured documents where I may never have seen a particular type before. Let's take a look at forms processing. Forms processing is a great example of how Project Cortex will let you enrich the content you have in your organization to turn it into knowledge. We begin by looking inside a Project Cortex library tied to my finance content center. I'm going to invoke AI Builder. AI Builder allows me to train a new AI model by handing it some documents that it will mine for structure. So we can see if I've uploaded a couple dozen documents, um, we can recognize things that might be key metadata I want to pull out from this document. And since this is a purchase order, we're going to go ahead and grab the vendor, and we'll grab the date, and grab a couple of other fields to define the model. Once I define the model, I can train it and publish it, and the model will be integrated using Power Platform directly to my library inside Project Cortex. Now, all I have to do is upload my purchase orders, and Cortex will automatically read those documents and pull out all the metadata that I need from them. Let's take a look at one. You can see that I now have precise metadata, which will unlock behaviors like search, compliance, and workflow in addition to enriching what I can see here on the screen interactively. So Project Cortex is our lead contender for how you can do more with content and knowledge throughout your organization with a range of management capabilities that integrate security, workflow, and AI, the ability to organize and connect information across your different systems, and deliver knowledge to people in the apps that they use every day. We also have a broad roadmap of capabilities coming up. Um, some of these capabilities will be shipping ahead of schedule. So some of our content connectors and um, search extensions will be moving into public preview very soon. We're expanding the scope of what you can do with taxonomy and manage metadata. Um, early next year, we will release the first version of Project Cortex version one, and there'll be a long range of solutions coming after it. Many organizations around the world turn to Microsoft 365 to be able to do more with their content. DLF India is the largest commercial real estate developer in India. Um, they were able to migrate away from a legacy solution to being able to use Office 365 to manage their mission critical compliant content, which resulted in a nearly two thirds reduction in their overall operating costs for their ECM infrastructure. You can learn about this and more through our online resources. Project Cortex will be moving into general availability in the first half of 2020. You can apply to join the private preview at the URL here on the screen, aka.ms slash Project Cortex. And for more information, you can visit our resource center or come to our content services resource center to learn about all of the things that we can do with your content in Microsoft 365. Thank you. All right, very good. That is Chris McNulty, Senior Product Manager with Microsoft. And Teresa, I understand Chris is also with us now to, take, uh, to discuss and take a few questions. Is that right? All right, Chris. Well, great. Well, while we've got you, I, just I know I had a couple of questions about Project Cortex. I really love the idea of a knowledge network. I'm still trying to understand how I might apply it. Can you give us an example of how an organization and what kind of process an organization might apply this approach to um, and what the results we could expect would be? Sure thing. So we have um, a couple of dozen customers who are already in private preview on this. And we see 
three kinds of solutions that they're using it for. First, um, Mott McDonald is a global engineering firm. They're using Project Cortex to shape their knowledge communities. So um, they already have all the content for 16,000 engineers around the world mastered in Office 365. And Project Cortex helps them shape that into one of the 47 talent communities they have for things like aviation and and bridges so that if you're an engineer on a new project, which happens on a daily basis there, you can quickly get up and learn what you need to know about your new project just by using the tools that are part of it, people's everyday work habits like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. We also have organizations using Cortex to automatically recognize design documents so that they can trigger custom processes when new design documents are then approved. And also organizations using this to manage a flow of 80,000 purchasing documents a week, um, being able to automatically recognize those and attach the right compliance. All right, so it sounds to me like when it comes to digital transformation and process improvement, this is a great enabling tool to, uh, to improve this and streamline the processes that drive your organization every day and really work to bring efficiencies on a new level as we, as we look to 2020 and beyond. Yeah, we, we hope so. Um, we're really proud to be able to bring these solutions into the market. What do you say to folks? Uh, I'm, I could hear maybe someone out in our audience today going, oh, God, you know, here comes another layer, uh, another thing to learn, another thing to manage. Um, what do you say to folks that are resistant of that change? And how will Project Cortex sort of ease the transition to using it? So we've, we hope we've learned from, you know, our customers about this. Um, our customers have told us they don't want yet another new platform that they have to integrate. In fact, we see Project Cortex as being successful for two reasons. First, um, it is based on your content that you already have in Office 365. So you don't need to migrate somewhere, migrate it to something else, and you can consume knowledge and generate it through the apps you're already using every day. Secondly, we are through Project Cortex shipping a range of search connectors. So if you have information that lives in some other silo, whether it's Box or File Shares or SQL Server or Google, you can integrate all of those information into Microsoft 365 to start getting the benefits that we have with Project Cortex. And tell me a little bit more about the AI component of it. Um, I, I know AI is somewhat mysterious, it can be mysterious, uh, and I, I guess I'm not always sure exactly how it works. It sounds like AI is really working in the background with Project Cortex. Can you explain a little bit more about how that works? I'd say it works in the background as well as in the foreground. You know, there's a lot of mystery to AI, and we see AI as being a tool for knowledge workers to be able to do more with their content. No one's going to read a billion documents. Um, and so we want to be very thoughtful about using AI to help teach, help use people to teach and curate the information. Um, so people are very much front and center with AI. And we look left to right across Microsoft to make sure that we're bringing the most relevant pieces of our research from across the spectrum, um, being able to use AI to process digital assists like images and with OCR, to recognize forums, as I showed you, and to recognize unstructured documents to be able to pull that out. And we're doing it in a way that we hope uh, makes it easy for people to use and consume. So very much at the forefront rather than just as a back end system. And how does it help me on the security side? I know we, we were talking about earlier uh, the idea of infor information governance and risk uh, yep. uh, mitigation and so forth being critical, so of course, but then also on the opportunity side. So how, do, how, does, how does Project Cortex help me on both those aspects of information management? Well, let me make it very simple. You may have a rule that says we're going to process contracts worth more than $10,000 differently than other contracts. We want to keep them encrypted. We want to make sure they're marked as records and are retained for 10 years. It, we can build a metadata, but it requires someone to enter the metadata about that. And using Cortex, we can automate even the metadata extract. So you can have a complete solution to make sure that um, your information essentially can govern itself. And Project Cortex is coming early next um, it year. It is coming in. Yeah, it, it is coming in the first half of 2020. Um, we are. Um, we feel very good about where we are in the engineering rollout. 
So you can look for more once we get into the new year. All right, very good. That is Chris McNulty, Senior Project Manager with Microsoft here about Project Cortex. Chris, thank you so much for being with us today. As always, thanks, Kevin. All right, Teresa, I guess now perhaps uh, it is our time to turn it over to you. Uh, is it time for a break? It is time for a brief break here, everyone. I um, very much want to thank the sponsors of our event today, AO Docs, Box, and Microsoft. With that, I think it is time for us to resume our afternoon session today. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, that is correct. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get back into some more presentations. You know, at AIM 19, we had some excellent presenters who shared a number of inspiring stories. And we want to share two of the ones that we thought were most illustrative of how each of these companies are winning in their digital transformation efforts and really making a difference to organizational performance. And the first one is with Candace McCabe. Now, I've talked with Candace McCabe a couple of times on the AIM On Air podcast, and she is with us um, with a video presentation from AIM 19. Now, Candace is currently a senior solution architect at Walmart, but when she gave this presentation, she was with J.B. Hunt Transportation, and it's a great story. Let's hear that video from Candace McCabe now. So without further ado, Candace McCabe. <clears throat> okay, so this session at one point received an automatic subtitle of Data's All That in a Bag of Chips. Um, and, and I really struggled because I was like, oh my gosh, I don't eat chips. What am I supposed to do for this and how is this supposed to work? Um, thankfully that went back, um, but I did leave it in my presentation, so it's there still. Um, but this is honestly how I feel about data. Um, I'm passionate about data and geeky in that way. My children look at me like I'm completely crazy on a regular basis because of it. Um, and I will probably talk fast and get very animated and move my hands a lot. Um, if you need me to slow down, just tell me, because um, I may just start going. All right, so who I am. Um, this is the lovely blurb that we put together that is supposed to summarize all of my vast knowledge or something. Reality is, I'm a girl who was an English major and a psych minor in college and never thought she would be doing anything like this. Um, but because I really like research and I really liked writing, I kind of moved into some BA roles and that moved into some PM roles and that moved into data architecture and it just kind of grew from there. I've been at JB Hunt for a little over 18 years. I started off in the data architecture side doing structured data modeling um, and analytics and then moved into an enterprise architecture role and I was supposed to do this small portion of my job that was information lifecycle management and that grew to take over my world and I am now responsible for architecting JB Hunt's information privacy and governance programs. So I'm a little busy but I, I like what I do and so I'll tell you how I have sold this to JB Hunt. I absolutely adored the things um, that Peggy was saying during the keynote. I was like, yes, I almost stood up and screamed amen a couple of times, um, but we'll get there. So we're gonna talk about the intrinsic value of data and we're gonna talk about governance and then we're gonna talk about how governance actually helps us to monetize data. And so if, Keep in the back of your mind that question that was posed and then the answer shown, is it easier to sell with value or risk? Because um, I have some thoughts on that and I'm gonna cover them. All right, so we've all heard this, right? Information is the world's new oil. Um, I like the bacon thing, I'm a keto dieter, hence the whole I don't eat chips, because um, <laughs> there aren't really good chips for me yet. Um, I like bacon, I like that, that symbolism, but Doug Laney actually made a comment that neither of those were good references because it's not a finite resource. It's a little more like nuclear energy. You can keep using it and withdrawing new insights and gaining more value. You just have to manage it in order to do so. Um, same thing is illustrated in CGOC's cost to value gap. 
So um, this, is, this is something you can use in your organization. Um, feel, please go out to CGOC's website and download this and use it in presentations often when you're asking for money for your programs. Um, because you, this is the fear factor, right? It costs 18 grand per gig to do discovery. We've all said storage is free, yeah, but processing is just not. Use these statistics, you know? The average cost of a data breach is $4 million. How about you give me like a couple hundred grand for that, right? Um, sell them on the fear, but then you sell them on the value. So you're getting a hint now how, what my thought process is on this. All right, so information is the new bacon or the new nuclear energy, whatever it is, it's a new currency in our world, right? Um, so look at it like you would any other asset. If you had a, you know, you've got a million dollars, what are you gonna do with it, right? So you're gonna maximize your asset portfolio, reduce cost, increase its value, safeguard it, and insure it. Okay, so a friend of mine wrote this book that I do like, not for necessarily people who are really into data science, it's really at a high level, but it's a good thing as an intro for um, executives to, re to read. Um, it, and I love that it says to add ROI, you have to think about the availability, accessibility, acquisition, and labeling. And governance plays a role. Yay, somebody's talking about us, right? <laughs> it's that validation we're always looking for. Okay, so I actually wanna go back here for just a second, and I wanna give you some scenarios. So you're gonna learn a little bit more about me. I told you I was an English major, right? Um, one of the reasons I was an English major is because I really like to read, um, and I like those epic, big kinds of stories and things. So I'm gonna give you a couple of scenarios, and some of you will probably recognize them and go, wow, the girl is a complete geek, but that's okay. So, I want you to picture yourself as the Lord High Commander of the Watch, and you have been given this giant wall, and that wall is to protect you from very scary, horrible things. And one day, a dragon comes in and takes out the wall. And somebody comes to you and says, okay, they got in, who's left? How do you know? I'm assuming you had a list of people that were there. These are your resources, your assets, right? You typically have a catalog of what you have and what you're protecting, all right? So here's another one for you. And this is a little more obscure, very much not today's pop culture. But let's say that um, you're responsible for a museum. And you have a very, very, very rare jewel in this museum. And you think it's invincible. You think all is good and someone was able to get in and steal it. How much is that jewel worth? Did you ever have it appraised? You know exactly what I'm referring to, right? <laughs> okay, that's kind of the way we've all dealt with protection of our assets and security over the years. For the last 20 years or so, security has all been about the perimeter, right? Build a big giant wall, keep the bad guys from coming in. What if the bad guy's already in your doors? It's, it's a concept like leaving your crown jewel sitting on the coffee table. So once they get in, they can take whatever they want. You've gotta safeguard those things and you've gotta insure them. That makes sense to everybody? All right, so how do you do that? I have to quit moving. This floor makes a lot of noise, sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you have to assess so figure out what you have. You've got to catalog your data. You've got to remediate your risk. And then you've got to repeat that process. 
It's all about risk identification and value identification, cataloging, remediation, and repeating. That's the governance side of it. So what's in an information governance catalog? Um, it's everything, right? So it's not just your structured data, it's not just your semi-structured data or your unstructured data. It's honestly everything you know about everything you have. Um, it's got your classifications and your categorizations, your, your valuations, and I think this is a place where a lot of us fall down. We, for, we forget to assign value to assets, um, but we wouldn't do that if it were our financial portfolio, so we have to keep that in mind. Um, and your, your policies, whether that's a security policy or a retention policy, um, and then usage and lineage is huge. And this is something that we all struggle with. So if you're working on a governance or privacy initiative at this point, you're probably doing a ton of subject matter interviews and data flow mappings. And it's painful and it, they're, you know that you're missing things but you don't know who to go to to get them. Um, use what you have and we'll get there in a second. But that's all the stuff that goes in that cataloging so that you can have a good picture of what that portfolio is and then allow others to use it to start maximizing value. All right, so this is that lineage piece and a little different spin on things than people are often used to when they talk about, you know, how, how does this move through our system? Um, you've got to look at applications and unfortunately that means somebody's got to be actually reading code probably because your applications are probably not documented as well as you would like for them to be. Um, web services are a big one. If you've got web services that are pushing data out, who's consuming them and what are they doing with them? And then what are your reporting systems doing? And how's that data migrating? Um, who wrote the jobs? What's in them? Are they written properly? And then your policies. Retention, security, and privacy. And privacy and security are not necessarily the same thing, right? So just because I have access to a system doesn't necessarily mean that I should see every bit of data in it because some of that data is more sensitive than others. Um, sometimes I have to store data in order to process a transaction that I don't ever need to expose to a human. Um, and retention policies are huge in reducing cost. So think about that $18,000 per gigabyte equation we were talking about earlier. For every record you remove, you're removing cost. So sometimes it feels like you're doing crazy metrics for no real reason, but for every record you dispose of, produce results every month, report that out, and say this is potential cost I've reduced, and just keep reporting that. How on earth do you do this? <laughs> it's a daunting task. You know you need it, but how are you gonna go about doing it? So this is where the, the title for this comes in. It's a quote by Teddy Roosevelt that I absolutely adore. Do what you can with what you have where you are. And this is not only my approach to life, it's my approach to this job. So where am I and what do I have at my disposal already that I can leverage before I have to go just start digging? You have a lot of things. You have probably some tool that's scanning your applications for security. It's got logging and metadata that you can use. Um, you've got some sort of content management system that has a wealth of metadata associated with it, right? You've got, um, for your structured data systems, you've probably got data models. Um, you may have data flow diagrams from some project that was done. You've probably got documentation from your, your, your application's development teams. When they developed an application, they probably put some, some documentation together. You need to pull all of those sources in together and then tie them together. Um, so I want to delve a little bit deeper into that concept real quick. Um, 
we all know that we need to do data profiling of some sort or variety, right? Whether that's done through interviews or it's actually done through trolling both our structured and our unstructured data systems. Take all of that data and merge it into a single catalog. And the next slide goes on to say people process content then technology. Figure out what those sources are. Figure out how you can borrow data from your apps dev team when they're doing an app scan um, before they go live to see if the code's good. Um, get all of those results and, and start small and build out a pilot where we say, okay, I can take all of this stuff and I can map it. Great. And then identify who you can empower to actually do this work. And then you're going to need a catalog. I'm not saying you have to go out and buy some giant catalog to begin with because A, you're not going to get funding because you're not going to be able to show that that's worth something, but eventually you will get to a wall. So my personal story is that we started with a spreadsheet. And then because at the time that I took over this role, I was the enterprise architect, I had a license to rational system architect because that is an enterprise architecture tool. Um, it's also a really not well-built development platform that'll put up a web front. Um, and so because I owned that and I knew how to write the code to generate it, it was basic VBA, I did that. A, I'm not a good coder and I don't like doing so, um, but it was, it was a place I could put data. But we've hit the point where that's no longer sustainable. Um, there were too many reports I needed to run. I wanted it to actually generate the maps for me rather than me doing that through writing reports. Um, and so eventually I had to go buy a catalog. Um, and if you want to talk at some other point about what that journey was like, I can talk to you about it. But I did want to say, start with that people in the process side get, and get that square and then build up what you need. All right, so what's the value proposition? Who cares? Because this, ultimately, you don't want to sell an insurance policy, right? It's not sexy, no one cares. Um, you can show, a, show your leadership, you know, the latest breach. Um, you can show them, you know, the CGOC stuff. But eventually, you've got to sell them something that makes them go, ooh, I can make money, right? <laughs> so it's that, it's, that, it's that balancing of the risk and the reward. Um, so what is that value proposition? Well, yes, it's risk management. The bigger things, though, are going to be the findability, the quality, and the security. And findability being the biggest thing. Um, so it actually creates value. So onboarding. In most organizations that I have been associated with, in order to onboard a new um, business intelligence or data science analytics resource, there's an awful lot of hand-holding and telling people where things are. Same thing happens in systems development. It happens in the business analysts that are sitting in the various lines of business. No one knows where stuff is. And there's an awful lot of education that has to occur before they learn where it is and how to, how to glean insights, right? Um, citizen data science. This is the wave of the future. In our organization, we're getting Power BI and rolling it out and teaching all kinds of people to write reports. But if they don't know where to go or they, don't, or they go to the wrong place, it's exponentially worse. Um, incident response. All right, so the wall came down. What happened? I don't know. <laughs> How do you report out that you've had a breach if you don't know what was breached? Um, impact awareness. If I change A, what happens to B? I don't know if I don't have the links between these things. If suddenly, Utah passes a privacy regulation and I need to go and update some field, what all am I potentially breaking on the back end? Um, E-discovery cost reduction, 
this is absolutely true. If you've ever had to participate in a large scale e-discovery action, it's painful. It requires a lot of people. Um, with a catalog, you can go, it's there. Go get that. Without it, you've got to pull in a bunch of subject matter experts and do interviews and then people have to walk through results repeatedly to say, yes, that actually is that data. Compliance, and then the biggest new revenue sources, monetization. This is the wave of the future, right? Again, information is not a limited resource. It's an ever-increasing potential for revenue in our world. And that's, that's honestly how we talk about it. J.B. Hunt has spent a lot of money empowering people and empowering systems in order to generate more data. We're, and we're all doing it, right? We're taking in data from the Weather Channel, or we're taking in data from you know, social media, whatever that is. But to glean the little nuggets of insight that are gonna make the difference, you've got to get rid of the junk that's in the way, right? <laughs> People have to know where to go for that data. They've got to be able to, to be able to find good data, um, and then find that single needle in the haystack. So, I told you that the do what you can with what you have where you are is one of my favorite quotes. And then I ran into this one, and I went, "Wow, that's even better." So, Maya Angelou. Do the best you can until you know better, and then when you know better, do better. And that's what we're all doing, right? It's, like I said, it's that, it's that cycle. Assess, remediate, repeat, right? Keep going. So what are the best practices of this? Build your business case. And do it in both of those ways, right? Point out all the risks, and then point out all the potential rewards. So. Here's your, here's your potential reward. Statistically, and I don't know where the statistic comes from, so this may be the next thing that we need to put out for AIM to vote on. 80% um, of the work that a data scientist does is in curating data. Just going out and finding it and cleaning it up. 80%. Your business has probably already put together the case for why we need data scientists. So figure out what that cost is. How much more productive are they if they are able to increase their workload? And use a, use a more realistic number, right? So you're gonna increase data science efficiency by 40%. It works. That's one of those, ooh, I can get more out of the data scientists? Good, because I got stuff I want them to do. Stakeholders and champions are going to be your biggest, your biggest help. In my organization, it's, I have a, a few. So my HR department, because they're always the ones that are on the privacy bandwagon. My legal team, because they're doing both sides of the, the house, right? So they're, they're worried about pr privacy protection, but they're also worried about contract management um, and compliance. And then Sell your analytics people, whoever that is in your organization, sell them on the fact that you're gonna help them out. You're gonna help them be more productive. You're going to help them only have the things that they need in order to make a difference. And then craft that message. So you're not selling insurance, you're selling potential. Um, and then passionate persistence. So I will say that, um, <clears throat> I had a former SVP who I would go into his office and I go, okay, so here's what we did and here's what I still need and this is how I think we can get there. And he would go, yeah, you're not getting money for that. But he would always say, but I do thank you for your passionate persistence. Um, it wasn't meant in necessarily the best way coming out of his mouth, but I took it that way. <laughs> Because I chose to view it as, I will continue to educate you until you are fully educated and on board with me. Let's go. <laughs> um, it's, 
be passionate. Tell everybody you can about what you're doing and why you're doing it, and why it's important, and how you're gonna allow them to make more money. That's the only way you'll get through. It's not necessarily gonna be a quick process, um, but it can happen. So, story to, to tag on to the passionate persistence here. Um, about a year ago, my CIO said, Candace, I swear, every time I talk to you, all I hear is, I have to have a catalog. I can't do this without a catalog. And let me tell you, I tried selling it in every possible way um, before I finally got one that stuck. But I, I, I went in with, I have to have it in order to do this apps project, because we're trying to you know, reuse web services. And he went, nice try. And then I went back in with, hey, um, so we're building this data lake. You're investing all of this money in this new project, but your data scientists aren't actually going to be able to use it because they're not going to have a catalog to know where to go. And he still kind of ignored me. But he did, he, he said to me, like I said about a year ago, he said, I swear every time I see you, you tell me you need a catalog. And I said, but I do. And he said, I'm going to buy you a t-shirt that says, where's my catalog? And I said, you know what, Stuart, that would be fantastic. And the day you buy me the catalog, I will wear that t-shirt. <laughs> so this t-shirt actually is on order from me, from his, from his administrative assistant, because he said, I know you don't want it to say, where's my catalog? I said, no. I said, I have a design in mind. And so. This is the t-shirt that my CIO is buying me for being passionately persistent. Um, that's it. Well, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much, Candice. All right, that is Candice McCabe from JB Transport. What a wonderful story about her experience there. All right, well, very good. Let's move right along to our next video presentation. And this is from Sylvan Richard. Um, Sylvan is Director of Information Management and Collaborative Systems for the Library and Archives in Canada, part of the Government of Canada. And his story today is about how the Library and Archives Canada successfully enabled an integrated digital workplace and a more intelligent approach to information management through a number of innovative approaches. Teresa, can we see that video now? Uh, I am Sylvain Richard, the Director of Information Management and Collaboration Systems at Library and Archives Canada. You'll see throughout my deck, I refer to LAC, so Library and Archives Canada. We are essentially the National Archives and National Library for the Government of Canada. I'm also a name certified information professional. So without further ado, the objective of our session today is to demonstrate how LAC has successfully enabled an integrated digital workplace using modern technologies and also social enterprise concepts. For those of you who are not familiar with social enterprise concepts, they're exactly the, are very similar to social media, you know, in people's personal lives, but applied to internal organizations, uh, and we call them social enterprise concepts. Uh, also, uh, the objective of the presentation is to demonstrate how LEC enables sound information management uh, practices across the organization, and this technique that we're applying within our organization, we've labeled it, called it, uh, LEC seamless and integrated approach to information management. And lastly, I will also briefly speak about the integration with our uh, official Government of Canada Electronic Document Records Management System, which is labeled uh, GC Docs, and uh, uh, I will be covering that as well. So first of all, context. A few years ago, uh, like many organizations, uh, we were facing uh, several IT and IM issues, you know, with old equipment, uh, aging equipment, a very high ratio of uh, devices per user, uh, an accumulation of unmanaged, unstructured information, uh, mostly traditional paper-based processes, and also inefficient uh, web and uh, intranet uh, publishing processes. This modernization started with uh, very strong senior management support. Uh, the organization wanted to become a digital organization within the federal government and wanted to be a leader in that space. 
Why is it important to address these challenges? Well, you know, uh, modern tool, modern practices, you know, I think it's, it goes without saying in most of uh, people's personal lives, we're very, you know, modern, you know, most people have smartphones, tablets, we interact with each other uh, on social media platforms, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever uh, the, the, your social platform is. But when, when we come into the office, you know, we tend to hoard information and, you know, collaboration is not, is not, you know, uh, all that easy. People tend not to want to collaborate because information is power, knowledge is power as well. So implementing modern practices so that, you know, we, we break down those barriers and we allow for uh, internal collaboration and knowledge sharing. Enabling a mobile workforce. Uh, if your organization haven't done so already, it's important to stop buying traditional desktops, buy laptops. Uh, this I mean, were, uh, certainly is would help with the mo mobility. Um, and uh, reducing the risk of managing information in multiple repositories. It's important, you know, it will never be able to centralize all the information in a single repository. And that's, uh, that's, that's for sure. But having a central platform that connects to multiple repositories and you know, can render reports uh, uh, effectively is, uh, is certainly uh, an important aspect of our approach. The automation of business processes, and we're not talking about RPA necessarily, we're talking about you know, improving efficiencies in how we automate and run our business processes creating a highly collaborative work environment and effective workplace, reducing duplication of effort and re reducing duplication of information is, uh, is also uh, front and center for us. To do that, uh, basically there are three layers. The basic base foundation layer is adding modern tools. So it goes without saying again, you know, Wi-Fi, laptops, a laptop without Wi-Fi is not really useful. A laptop with Wi-Fi but doesn't have anything to connect to is not that useful either. So the, the middle layer is the uh, content services layer or the enterprise content management solution, which is no longer uh, the buzzword these days. But so you have modern tools that you dis deploy to your users with connectivity methods that connect to a central platform where they can go collaborate and then lastly, at the top of the pyramid, you've got the, the modern practices. So basically changing the way people work, uh, changing, uh, like changing the culture around how people work and uh, enabling uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, the first two layers are quite easy to do. They're IT driven, you know, you can deploy equipment fairly easily, you can deploy a platform. That's why it's in green, technology focus. The difficult aspect is changing the behavior. Like I said, it's not necessarily human, you know, part of human nature to collaborate effectively within the work environment. So it's very, very important for your organizations to have a strong user awareness program to raise the awareness, raise the desire of your user community so that they understand uh, why you know we're trying to push uh, a new way of working. It's also very important to have strong governance around uh, the, the use of, of such collaboration platform because it's not uh, without governance, governance actually your environment can become really really chaotic very very rapidly. One of the fundament, fundamental concepts that needs to be implemented or that we have implemented, I should say, uh, is having a solid IM information management strategy. And you get that through your governance committees, you get that approved. That IM strategy does not talk about technology per se. It doesn't talk about a product or, or, or whatnot, but it talks about concepts and what you're trying to achieve as an organization on how to better the information management practices with your, within your organization. So basically our IM vision, IM will be visible until it becomes invisible. What that means is that people are hired to get the job done, okay, thinking that we will, IM and records management practitioners, will turn all of the employees within our organizations into record keepers. 
It's not going to happen, okay? Because they're hired to get the job done. They, they're, they're working in HR, they're working in finance, they're working in a program to get the job done. You know, and then when we're after them to say, well, and you need to file your stuff, you need to complete the metadata, you need to do this, you need to do that. It's been difficult for years and it will continue to be difficult for years to come if we don't change our approach on how we actually do information management and record keeping, okay? So IAM will be visible until it becomes invisible. Our approach is that we're setting up workspaces, aka SharePoint sites, where, that are tied to business processes. Okay, so as people execute their business process, they come and execute their business process in these workspaces, workspaces, and they don't even think about IAM, but all of these business workspaces are tied to the file classification plan and so on. So behind the scene, we're actually capturing metadata and the workspaces are also tied to the specific function of the file plan. But at the, on the front end, you know, the, the workspaces are designed to run a business process. So having done so, IAM becomes invisible because the users don't even really see IAM. You know, IAM happens in the back end. And when you're successful at doing that, then you're able to gain insight from the information you collect and then you can really leverage and harvest knowledge, you know, from, from the information that you collect from your users. There's a reason why Facebook, you know, has become a multi-billion company is, you know, everybody's going in, they're contributing into the Facebook platform voluntarily, and Facebook, you know, on the other end, takes information and sells that information, you know, without sharing your name and so on and so forth, but they share, you know, geolocation and all kinds of information with companies that are willing to pay a lot of dollars for that information. So, in a sense, IM is invisible to them because, you know, they are actually sharing that information in the back end. So uh, a few words on the IAM strategy. The, the main focus of our IAM strategy is really to improve operational efficiencies. So improve the way people are working and how we're really leveraging the information that is captured, preferably in a structured format. Uh, and I'll be covering uh, a structured versus unstructured uh, a little bit later on. We'll never get rid of unstructured. Unstructured is always there. But the more we can do in a structured fashion, and to a certain extent, the more we can structure the unstructured uh, really enables you know, uh, us for success. Facebook does that as well. You, know, you upload an unstructured picture, and they tie you know, metadata to it. They do geolocation, you know, face recognition, and so on and so forth. Well, essentially, that's all structured data that they're attaching to, or metadata, that they're attaching to your unstructured objects that you're uploading. Integrating IAM within the business processes in the back end, I've already mentioned that, gaining the insight and being able to leverage business intelligence, and also the concept of reuse uh, reusing it. So if you've captured the information in a workspace tied to a business process and another business process needs that information, well, we actually go and connect to the other workspace and bring that information in and present that in the other workspace as well. Okay. There's always, uh, in the Government of Canada, there's an aspect of compliancy with IAM policies and directives. So that's always, you know, for us, our, our uh, records management and IAM practitioners, that's very important. But for their users, really, they don't, they don't really care about the, uh, the IAM policies that we have to, uh, to respect. For all, uh, if you care to see a copy of our IAM strategy, the hyperlink is there. You have access to the deck in, uh, in the application. So basically, uh, we have two, two SharePoint instances at Library and Archives. First of all, uh, on, uh, on your left-hand side, you have a SharePoint 2010 uh, platform that we use to, uh, to host our internet uh, presence. Our internet presence is uh, probably one of the largest in the Government of Canada in terms of content. We have a lot of content at Library and Archives, images, pictures, and all kinds of interesting stuff in our collection. LAC Direct is our external collaboration platform where our internal people, they request workspaces and then we are able to exchange with external entities by invitation so people collaborate, co-author documents uh, on, on LAC Direct. Internally, we use uh, SharePoint 2016 to host our intranet and also our collaboration portal. So the collaboration portal will, uh, will be a focus of this presentation. 
We've been using SharePoint since the year 2010. So we have hundreds and hundreds of workspaces that have been developed. SharePoint has grown to become one of the largest, if not the largest, system at Library and Archives Canada. A lot of content, everybody, every user is using it, and a lot of it, uh, a lot of our business processes actually rely on the SharePoint platform. And if you're questioning why we have still have 2010, well, we're, we've got a migration project to migrate to 2016, and we'll eventually migrate to 2019 as well. Um, because we have so much content, migration is not uh, an easy task. It's quite complicated, actually. And um, all of this is on-prem. So we have an external uh, SharePoint, which is outside of the DMZ. And we have uh, our SharePoint 2016 internal platform, which is within the DMZ. Some of the guiding principles, because when we launched the collaboration portal many years ago, users were all confused. They said, well, what's the difference between that and the intranet. So we came up with guiding principles and essentially our intranet is used to publish official, uh, official information of, uh, uh, in both official languages, French and English. It's not a platform, the intranet is not the platform to do data capture. There's no data capture there at all. You, users think they're doing data capture on the intranet, but they're not. Actually, they're being uh, rerouted to uh, the collaboration portal. Uh, we have a real-time news feed, so we no longer send an email every Wednesday saying, well, these are all the things happening next week or last week or whatnot. Things are published on the real-time news feed as they happen uh, on a daily basis. The collaboration portal, on the other hand, supports the IM strategy that I spoke about a few minutes ago. It's also our main repository, uh, well, one of the main repositories uh, for data capture uh, of these business processes. Okay, so the data capture takes place on the collaboration portal and a lot of the presentation, the official presentation, is done on the intranet side of things. And it supports the information life cycle. Uh, we have this concept uh, in the Government of Canada we call the information resources of business value. So really the information, the records that we care about that guide our organization, you know, where we record our stuff, uh, record decisions and so on and so forth, they're called IRBVs and you'll see that elsewhere in my presentation as well. So essentially, the collaboration portal has become the place where people work. We placed our network shared drives in read mode in 2016. Uh, two months ago, we completed an artificial intelligence uh, project to actually classify over, uh, approximately 10 million documents from the shared drives into our EDRMS. So we've gone from 9.5 million documents, actually, to 3.5 million documents after we completed the AI project. Uh, of auto classification. So the shared drives is no longer being used at all at Library and Archives uh, by users. They are forced to use the collaboration portal to store their content, unstructured content that is. Our intranet, this is what our intranet looks like. Uh, you see on the uh, top left side in touch news, that is the news feed. Uh, you've got the upcoming events, uh, but all of the publishing process, the content creation that ends up on the intranet, that workflow, that process, publishing process, is all done within the collaboration portal. So we've got an online form that users request, you know, they want to publish something on the intranet. So they go, you know, they, there's actually one of the links that says, well, communication service request on the most requested links. They click on that and an online form appears. So they say what they want to do. And then the publishing process follows a workflow. It goes through communications branch. And then after everything is done and approved, and everything is done in both official languages and officially done, then boom, things appear on the intranet. So the intranet and the collaboration portal are on the same platform, and they're really intertwined. Um, other links that you see point also to the collaboration portal. So even though the content is presented on the intranet, actually the, the, the source of it resides on the collaboration portal. The collaboration portal looks like this. There's a big focus on search. Now, there's a number of repositories that we're searching, and there's always a possibility to add more. Uh, we're indexing, we've indexed, you know, previously indexed the shared drives, full text search. Um, some of the issues that that caused, that people could now find stuff that they had stored on the file shares years ago within 25 folders deep, which I called 
security by obscurity uh, that no one could find previously. But now with a search engine like this, you know, we presented that and people were like, wow, you know, the big bad SharePoint is, you know, disclosing information. Well, it was disclosing information that was open in the first place. You know, SharePoint does respect uh, user privileges. So if you don't have access to something, it won't be disclosed. But if you do, it will be disclosed. So it took about two years of fine tuning uh, not that we fine-tuned the search engine, we fine-tuned the users <laughs> to say, well, if you are seeing things you're not supposed to see, let's see where you've stored it on the shared drive, and then let's either delete it, move it, or restrict it uh, in order to prevent that. So search is a big portion, and again, with SharePoint, there's a possibility to index multiple repositories and even you know, render and use other indexes to present the content. We, I will be talking extensively about uh, function-based classification and function-based workspaces, okay, which can be found under these, uh, these uh, in the navigation on the, those, uh, those uh, sections. But we have kept one area under branches for org-based, organizational-based structure, because director generals in our organization, they tend to, well, you know, our users, they want to be able to store stuff that is not related to a function, so they, they needed another place to store that stuff. Some of the benefits of the collaboration portal, basically there are benefits of SharePoint. Uh, I'm not going to go through them extensively, uh, but basically automatic versioning, so educating our users to stop naming stuff version one, version two, version final, version final, final, version final, final, version one, and so on and so forth. So naming the things, you know, the objects, the right name from the get-go and keeping it this way because automatic versioning takes place uh, automatically in SharePoint. Access controls, uh, alerts, some, you know, there's, uh, often there, there are urban legends that people say, well, you know, Who's going to touch my stuff? It's not ready to be to 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 be to go on the collaboration portal because someone may modify it. it. Quite frankly, it doesn't happen. But if it does happen, we have logging mechanism, and there's always version history, and there's always alerts. You can set alerts, and you'll get an email if that document is so important to you. You want to see who's accessing it. You set an alert on it, and you'll get a daily email or weekly email or an email as people access it. It's funny we heard this morning about the client focus user experience. That is our, that has been our focus. You know, if if you you can design the best systems, but if the user experience is not positive, they're not going to use it, or they're going to find ways to circumvent it and you know work elsewhere or in a different fashion. So, client focus user experience is at the front front and center of our approach. Uh, we've got a number of IM tools uh, to facilitate that, but our front end is SharePoint, uh, business process automation, structured, unstructured. Uh, out of the box, SharePoint out of the box, now don't, the, the, the percentages are not scientific uh, numbers by any means, you know, they're just an approximation. When we spin up uh, sites or workspaces, typically they're built with about 70% you know, of the functionality comes from out of the box SharePoint. Which is, you know, if you think of SharePoint Online, that's all that SharePoint Online offers. SharePoint Online offers far less capabilities than the SharePoint on-prem. About 25% uh, of the functionality that we put in a workspace comes from third-party products. Third-party products, those are companies that actually make a living, and there's a number of them on the floor here, of complementing the functionality of SharePoint. Okay, so you, you install those third-party products on top of SharePoint to do things better. For instance, we use Nintex as a workflow engine because the basic SharePoint engine for workflows is quite basic, you know, and with Nintex, we control permissions, we do a lot of stuff with Nintex. And then lastly, because our of our client focus user experience and sometimes the users they are the OPI the officer of, of primary interest want to see something on a workspace and they, it's do or die you know they absolutely need that then we actually introduce custom code to to give them a better user experience and so that you know uh, user adoption uh, also is increased as a result 
in the back end, our GC docs or ADRMS uh, sits there. Users don't directly access the ADRMS. They, they do, but indirectly. Uh, we present documents, but uh, basically they, they don't have access to the ADRMS interface. They, in order to access the documents that we they, they transition over to the ADRMS, they have to uh, uh, transit through either the shared drive or the, uh, the SharePoint platform. As I mentioned, we actually closed our shared drives, we migrated the content to the EDRMS, but we left pointers from the shared drive. So users navigate the shared drives, they think they're accessing, uh, they're on the shared drive, but they're not. They, they click on, on, the, on the link, it renders the document, but the document sits in the EDRMS system. So some of the concepts of, for us, you know, record management uh, practitioners, you know, were, you know, RM is a sub-function of IM, okay? And unstructured information, you know, consists of physical files and, you know, unstructured files. And, you know, they're typically stored in filing cabinets or on network file shares. Um, it's difficult to apply controls uh, over unstructured because it's so easy to copy uh, unstructured information and you know and then you don't know where it's going after people have copied it and there's very limited business process automation that can be done with unstructured okay now i am structured data and information management concepts are much more powerful you know they're highly dependent on structured systems because the information is stored in a database uh, the data capture is done with online forms you know when you're shopping online on amazon you're not completing a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet, and you're not emailing an attachment to Amazon. You know, Amazon have very greatly efficient business processes. You shop online, you're looking at all of the objects that you have online, you're not navigating a, a, a directory structure, you're actually navigating uh, views of the objects you're trying to purchase, and you click purchase, you complete the form, whatever it is, you hit purchase, and boom, you, know, the, you actually see the workflow, you know, the items have been dispatched, shipped, and boom, you get it a couple days later and it's in, uh, on your doorstep. That's a very highly efficient business process and it's done with structured data as opposed to unstructured. So the online world has already evolved to structured, uh, structured data and has already evolved to workflows and highly efficient business processes. So the key takeaway from this slide is that we need to evolve from traditional unstructured records management to structured, highly efficient business processes, similar to, uh, like I said, the online world or other uh, organizations uh, around the world that have actually uh, done so. So with structured data, obviously, you can generate the cube of information. With structured data, you can slice and dice that cube and generate reports, uh, geotagging reports, uh, geolocation, I should say, uh, and all kinds of information you know, that you can extract. So do some real, true business intelligence uh, from, uh, from the structured data that has been captured. So to do so, we need to move the people from their traditional mindset of in basket, out basket, sending the information from one user to the other user, sending the information unstructured from one person to the other person. Okay, a lot of time is wasted uh, when information travels from one person to the other. Okay, and if you're looking for a report that's been sent on the Friday afternoon uh, to, within your organization, and if John is not there to render the information, you know, well, no, nobody can find it, and a lot of wasted time, it's not very efficient. So a digital mindset is one where the information sits dead in center in one location and people actually create the information resources, they collaborate on, on, on those information resources and the workflows actually are, are moving uh, it from person to person but the information does not move actually, it, 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 it sits dead in center and it enables uh, proper decision making. Basically, the information uh, in the digital mindset, the information and the authoritative location of where the information is captured becomes the authoritative source. Because you know that you've got this workspace that's been designed to capture it in one location, and if you need to refer to it later, everybody knows that that is the authoritative source, as opposed to sending the information around and uh, without the context. And you can always 
control access to the repository because you know it sits in one central location. Whereas unstructured information that is being shared via email, attachments, and so on and so forth, you don't know where the information is going to end up at the end of the day. So at Library and Archives, uh, one of the basic things that we put in place a few years ago is a, a very solid uh, information architecture. Uh, that is the foundation of you know, our IAM approach. Basically, we've documented our, our file plan, our business capability model is we've documented all of the functions that are being executed within our organization. So we've got 18 functions. They vary from program functions to corporate functions. Those functions, for instance, HR would be a corporate function. Uh, then at a more granular level, you've got sub-functions, okay? So HR would be the function, then staffing would be a sub-function of HR. And then within the sub-functions, you've got business processes. So we've taken the time to document approximately 400 business processes within our organization, okay? So some of the concepts of the seamless and integrated approach to IAM that I've been speaking about is that the file classification plan documents the functions, the sub-functions, the business processes. The business processes all generate a fruit, and that fruit is an information resource of business value. So if you have business processes that do not generate information, kill that business process, it's useless. All of the business processes must generate information resource of business value or you know, operational information that is key to your organization. Then tied to those IRBVs, we've got retention and disposition schedules. Those are very important from an RM perspective, but you document them in your information architecture or in your file classification plan. Basically, that structure dictates how the information is classified within our organization. And it also resolves a question that is often being asked is, who's the owner of that information? Well, you know, we have tied owners for all of these, uh, for all of these functions and sub-functions. Every organization has this. You know, we've got business functions that we're running. And for many of us, we've got structured systems that we use, whether it's an HR system, a finance system, or you know, we have some, uh, some asset management systems within our organization. So they're big structured systems, and that's great. You know, all of these repositories, they are associated to our file classification plan. But many business processes did not have a structured system. So this is where the collaboration portal comes in. So we've crafted workspaces for business processes that did not have a system. The, system, the, the business processes used, uh, were running before, but they were running with email, you know, email attachments, shared drives, user drives, you know, on the corner of a, you know, a piece of paper. Not very structured, not very efficient. So to, to support all of these other business processes, we've actually, we're actually crafting workspaces. And we've come up with a concept of dedicated workspaces. Basically, dedicated workspaces are tied to specific business processes. Okay? We're using a function-based classification methodology. So all of the dedicated workspaces are tied to a function or a sub-function of our file plan. And those workspaces offer an opportunity for, for the organization to actually uh, automate that business process. And typically, we go through a few iterations. We need about three to four iterations of a workspace before the users and the owners of the workspace really realize the capabilities and functionality that we can bring to the, you know, to the workspace to improve the way the business process runs. Typically, you know, when we start with a, a client, for a business process, the very first iteration is very basic. It's almost like a shared drive type workspace. But as things evolve, they realize, well, they look at their neighbors that, that are also have other workspaces and say, well, you're doing workflows. Oh, you're sending emails automatically when this happens. Oh, you've got a workflow that does this and that. Then we start adding functionality to their workspaces. And then all of these workspaces evolve to become more and more efficient. And we leave it up to the OPIs to determine if they need to restrict access or not to their workspace. We promote open by default as much as possible because restrictions really defeats collaboration. So it's important to, to note. I refer to them as you know, a workspace, a dedicated workspace is like having a specialized tool to do a, a, or execute a, a given business process. The My Branch or the generic workspaces are more generic, and actually, we have this concept of work activities and projects where it's like creating a new folder on a shared drive. 
in an absence of a dedicated workspace for a business process, then we ask the users to turn to uh, the My Branch or their work activities and projects to store their information. And sometimes, you know, they will start in a work activity and project and evolve that content and eventually move it to a specific dedicated workspace on, on this function. And here I refer to a Swiss Army knife. You can do a lot with the work activities and projects, but they're very basic and they're not as good and as focused as a dedicated workspace would be. So in the navigation, really to bring and to tie all of that uh, together, you saw the, on the left-hand side of the menu, uh, if you click on corporate function, okay, so you've got for, uh, program functions and corporate functions. If you click on corporate functions, you'll see the list of the file classification plan corporate functions. If you click on one of the corporate functions, in this case is financial management, you're actually going to see the list of all of the dedicated workspaces that have been put together, put in place to support various business processes within the finance, financial management function. So three layer, very simple. Like shared drives used to have many, many, many folders deep, right? And now we've simplified it to really three layers of navigation. So corporate and program functions, and then the list of the file classification plan functions, and then dedicated workspaces that were crafted for that. This is a sample of a screen for a, a dedicated workspace. Uh, this one is for a, a human resource action request. So, this is probably our third iteration of the HRAR uh, workspace, and this one is the latest one, and it's really becoming like HR is on board, and we're doing all kinds of fancy reporting. We've, this is probably our most complicated dedicated workspace. It has hundreds of workflows, so actions, you know, as people select on the online form. So users are not completing a Word document here. They're actually completing an online form with drop down, so we're really controlling the data entry, and if, if the organization wants to submit an HR request, they're forced to use this online form to capture their content. They don't have a choice. And if you look at the top, you've got different tabs. So you've got a security clearance tab, you know, and other checklists and HR assistant tabs. So depending on who you are in the organization, you'll have access to, to those tabs or not, okay, to capture the information. And then this online form, after it's saved, it generates an email. And the email is loaded with links. Oh, sorry. Uh, the email is loaded with links, so there's no attachment in the email ever. And, the, and all of that email, it's all transitory information. And really, the email has no business value at all because the content has all been captured within the workspace itself. And basically, we're prompting a decision maker to make a decision on approving this action request from the email. So they can directly go in the email and approve the next action and then it moves to the next person. But the data always stays in the same place. And interestingly, uh, in this particular process, because of the Finance Administration Act in the federal government, we're asked to, to capture a digital signature. So with the structured data that we captured part of the process, we're actually generating an unstructured document. But that unstructured document actually resides within the workspace. That workspace is tied to the uh, file classification plan and it's wrapped with metadata. The entire workspace itself, the governance that we have is in order to request a workspace, you need to go to the IM team uh, before the workspace is created. So they actually tie it to the file classification plan and they confirm that there's not already another workspace that exists for that exact same function. And then another aspect of this is obviously the workflow. You need to approve or reject uh, the action, uh, which is different than the digital signature. As you start evolving, you know, uh, with SharePoint, it's really easy to create sites. So for basic workspaces, we go in, you know, and the IT team sits down with the client and we start crafting a workspace directly there on the fly. And within hours, we've got workspaces that are, you know, put up. But for complicated workspaces, we strongly recommend that you do come up with a, work, uh, um, a process flow diagram because you need to be on the same page. Before you start codifying a business process, make sure that you agree on the way of working because when you're automating business processes and codifying your business process, you very quickly realize that out of a room of 20 users that do the same thing, they do it 
20 different ways, okay? They end up doing this, probably the same result at the end, but they all kind, kind of take different routes to get there. So when you codify a business process, well, you actually formalize the way the process is running. So, so you'll craft a workspace with a workflow and so on and so forth, and you'll have many unhappy users because they say, well, that's not the way I used to do it. You know? So it, getting people to change the way they work, so right up front, if you come up with a process flow diagram and you say, well, this is what we're going to be building for you, you agree that the workflow is going to go here and then this and this is going to happen and so on and so forth, well, you do that first, you get an agreement, then you design your workspace. And uh, as we progress through our uh, information management life cycle, so we've got our workspaces here that we're creating, dedicated workspaces. Then uh, transfer rules is where we're at in building transfer rules to transfer information from the workspaces to our GC docs, EDRMS, okay? So uh, we've done some transfer rules, but transfer rules you know, are a lot of work because we have to sit down with the OPIs or the workspace owners and agree on when are we going to move your information to our EDRMS? Because it's important to keep the information in here uh, relevant. So the rules that I'm talking about here are not the retention and disposition schedule rules. The retention and disposition schedules are set in GC Docs. So these transfer rules are really to keep the workspace clean and active. You know, whatever is active information, uh, if it's active for two years, after that, you know, you move them over to GC docs so that the workspace remain very clean and relevant and it's not, you know, uh, full of obsolete information. The obsolete information ends up, you know, or after it's, the information is no longer really active, you move it to GC docs. So I said I was going to speak about the integration with GC Docs. Uh, basically, uh, in GC Docs, you see the exact same folder structure of the file classification plan. So corporate functions, program functions, and you've got the list of all of the corporate functions here, exactly the same as the file classification plan and exactly the same as the architecture behind SharePoint and how we've designed SharePoint. So, uh, and we're, the, the functionality we're using to move the information from SharePoint to GC Docs is the AGA connector from Content Server. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I said it, but GC Docs is built on Content Server, Open Text Content Server. Um, oh. So basically, uh, what we're working towards is that people will go in the collaboration portal and look at a file, click on the file, and the file is actually located in, in the EDRMS. So this is the EDRMS, and you see the exact same file. And the file is open and rendered, but it's actually sitting in the EDRMS. And I'm talking here at the end of its operational use within the collaboration portal. So, all of the editing and collaboration and interaction with the information happens in, file, in the collaboration portal. The GC docs is read only for the user. So when this file becomes read only, you know, it's no longer relevant uh, for the business process, then we move it over with transfer rules, we move it over to the ERMS, and then we present it back to the user as when, if they ever need to access it. But uh, once they end up in GC docs, they're in read mode. So, uh, in the last four minutes, what's important, uh, I'd like to cover the lessons learned. Well, this is not a one-person endeavor, okay? It does require a very significant a culture shift. Uh, it will stress test, or it will test uh, the senior leadership maturity within your organization because various director generals in the organizations or VPs, whatnot, they have their own interests and, you know, they, Implementing a new way of working will really, you know, uh, create some frictions uh, across the organization, and it's important that we. That's why the IM strategy is so important because you know that is your your uh, your lantern or whatever the lighthouse that you're aiming at, you know, and that uh, it moves the organization forward. New senior management may send you in a different direction. You know, sometimes new senior management comes in and. They don't actually have all the understanding that, you know, or the history, and they will point you in a different direction that may derail your entire approach. Never underestimate people and organization resistance to change, and you will encounter passive resistance, and passive resistance, so people say, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, but they don't, and derailing strategies. People will actually try to, on purpose, try to get you, send you in the ditch and uh, to derail the way you're moving forward with your approach. 
You must obviously apply change management techniques to change the way people and, uh, and you know, the organizational behaviors as well. Build it and they will come. You'll get maybe 25, 30% of the people that are really gung-ho and they want to move things forward. Uh, but don't assume that people will see the benefit in what you're trying to do. Again, you know, we're information management practitioners, you know, and we know what we're trying to achieve, but users, they have a different agenda and they, they may not see the benefits. Eventually, you need to impose a new way of working. Uh, executive support, you know, back in the day, filing, paper filing was done by executive support. Well, that role has transitioned now to a digital filing concept and it's very important to get them on board because if you train them and you explain the benefits to them, then they will enable your executives to actually do proper information management and you know, use the workspaces. It's not easy to get people to collaborate. Information and knowledge is power and fundamentally, people will tell you, well, it's not, I'm not ready to put that document in the collaboration portal. Yes, you are. You, you should create it there in the first place. People should collaborate on it. People should, you know, help you. And they'll say, yeah, 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 but they don't because, you know, information is power. Knowledge is power as well. Over-restricting access defeats collaboration. I uh, can't stress that enough. People have permission issues and so on and so forth because they've tied, you know, the resources so tightly and then they're surprised, you know, they've tied their hands and feet and so on and they're surprised they can't run. Well, it's because you've, you've applied too many restrictions on your workspace. Keep it open and use other, met, other methods to, uh, to rectify a breach or a, a conflict. Like we have code of conduct, you know, leverage a code of conduct to, to to, to rectify a, an employee behavior that was not appropriate as opposed to trying to do everything with permissions. Business process owners must agree to move into a digital way of working, like they are the owner of the business process and if they don't want to modernize the way they work, well, you, you can hope for the best but it's not going to move forward. Really you need to get them on board and they're the ones who are actually going to sell the way of working in a digital fashion because you know it's their business process. People expect close to perfection very early on. You know they think that everything's going to be magic and perfect right off the bat, and it's not the case. You know why? Because the people we work with are the you know the people that know the business process, and they think they know the business process well. But as soon as you start codifying that business process, you see that you know they've got different ways of working, and it's uh, it's. It's very difficult to reach perfection when you've got 20 people that think 20 different ways on how the business process should be executed. Adapt a catchy name for your collaboration portal, whatever it is, don't call it SharePoint. People will end up calling it SharePoint anyways, but anyways, do your best to use a catchy name. Uh, a mobile workforce, yeah, well, I can skip over that. Uh, so the last slide, food for thought. It's not all about technology. Uh, it's mostly about business processes and people. That's, uh, that's what it's all about. Get rid of the rear view mirror. I've been using this, you know, this slide for, for a long time and uh, yesterday's presentation speaks exactly to that. You know, people will tell you, well, I've always done it this way. Yeah, well, that's in the past. Focus on the windshield, you know, low, the way forward. Focus on the way forward. You know, we're changing the way the organization is functioning, so focus on the future. Adapt. Adopt a pragmatic approach. It needs to be concrete. Very rapidly when you design a workspace, it needs to make sense quickly. Otherwise, people are just not gonna you know, get the buy-in. Adopting a digital mindset. People need to get used to working in a digital fashion. It goes beyond saying digital transformation. It's actually, you know, digital does not happen with paper. It happens with you know, IT and systems, and that's the way of the future. So moving off of traditional paper business processes, traditional paper way of working is not going to make your organization a digital organization. Remember, it's iterative. So a workspace or whatever your approach, you'll have multiple iterations before you improve the way uh, things are done. And lastly, have tolerance for imperfection because you're not going to all design it perfectly from the get-go. So this is it. This is the end of my presentation. Well, all right. That is Sylvain Richard from the Library and Archives of Canada telling us their story of uh, their efforts with intelligent information management. I think a story that really illustrates many of the key points that we've been talking about today. Um, and just to 
tie us up with a bit of a bow, I just have a few thoughts that I'd like to share based upon what we've, what we've seen today and heard today. And as we look at our vision for 2020 and beyond, it occurs to me that we're really at 2020, we're at a new year, a new decade, but really the start of what I see as a new generation in the way that we do business and uh, a future that is driving us to a world that maybe looks a little different than what we've been used to. And the question for us is, are we prepared? And so here are three suggestions that, that came to me as we were going through the session today that I would recommend that folks look at in 2020 um, very, uh, with respect to their strategic design. And number one is evaluate and modernize your infrastructure. You know, it can be difficult to adopt 21st century techniques when you're working on 20th century technologies and yet many oper uh, operations are running as if it was 1999 with software that's 10 or more years old. And that can be difficult to adopt the advances and capabilities that we're talking about, say in AI and analytics or the mobile workforce or, or the cloud when we're working with an infrastructure that is behind that curve. So uh, I think we heard Tony from ADOCS talk about that today and certainly uh, Sylvan from uh, Canada as well. The other one that I would say is to embrace the cloud. You know, this sounds like an easy recommendation, but uh, the cloud certainly is the de facto standard for our environment today. Yet many of us really have not made the leap to the cloud, or if we're working with the cloud, we're working in, in sort of uh, limited or pocketized or siloed ways. Um, and to me, the real advantage of the cloud is that there's not a need to build it all from scratch. Many providers and, and, and developers are now providing cloud solutions that are tailor-made to uh, processes and workflows that are common to every organization and indeed a number of industry-specific or process-specific applications. Um, I think we heard Rand talk about a lot about some of the capabilities that are available with the cloud and Box and the same with Chris from Microsoft with some developments coming down the road there. So embrace the cloud. And finally, my third recommendation for our new year is to establish a cross-functional information management team uh, to help create and sustain improvements. Um, information management, intelligent information management may seem like it's an IT thing, but really the stakeholders are across the organization and indeed, the performance of our organization is at stake. So I think top performing organizations work to establish a cross-functional information management team that it is their responsibility to, to develop uh, techniques and capabilities that make a difference and then ensure that those capabilities are then replicated across the entire organization. And our, our last uh, speaker, uh, Sivan Richard, um, I think so beautifully illustrated that um, it's not just one person. It is a cross-functional team. So those are my 2020 New Year's rec resolutions or recommendations for us as we bring this uh, session to a close. Uh, I would like to remind us all that uh, one more time that the deadline for, uh, well, we have a deadline coming up on December 20th. Registration for AIM 2020 will go up in price to 350 bucks, uh, up another $350. So it's now is a good time to get your slot reserved for AIM 2020. It's easy. You can just go to aimconference.com and register there. That's A-I-I-M conference.com and register there. And I'd like to thank our sponsors for the event today, AO Docs, Box, and Microsoft. And again, thank all of you for sticking with us all the way to the end. Um, for Teresa Rezik and the rest of the team at AIM International, I am Kevin Crane. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.